We'll just. Good morning, I'm City Council Member Richie Torres, and I chair the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. I'm honored to co lead today's hearing with Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel, who chairs the Committee on Public Housing. We are also joined by Council Members Jonai, who represents the Roxneck Houses, Council Member Diaz, Council Member Powers, and I'm sure we'll be joined by a few Council Members later on. Before we dig deep into the details of mismanagement, at Throgsneck Houses and elsewhere in NYCHA, it's important to never forget the historical context, the story of how NYCHA went from being the gold standard among housing authorities to the worst landlord in New York City. It is a story familiar to many of you, but nonetheless worth repeating with an ever greater sense of urgency. NYCHA is crumbling under the weight of a $32 billion capital need. Buildings are getting older and older, Living conditions are getting worse and worse. Budget challenges driven by higher costs and federally unfunded mandates are getting wider and wider. The root cause of the humanitarian crisis in NYCHA is federal disinvestment. Those who claim otherwise and deny the depth of the federal government's disinvestment are living on a different planet from our own. In choosing to resign instead of setting signing in a questionable agreement with SDNY and HUD, an act of integrity seldom seen in public life, Stanley Brezinoff, the former chair of the New York City Housing Authority, said the following, quote, how is it possible for there to be moralizing from the U.S. attorney as if NYCHA was a creature unto itself, not dependent on federal resources? Mr. Brezinoff is correct. NYCHA is not a creature unto itself, it is a federal obligation, poorly but primarily funded and regulated by the federal government. NYCHA is indeed a creature of the federal government and more specifically HUD, which is as much an absentee landlord as the very housing authority wishes to scapegoat in order to deny the truth of federal disinvestment. In his interview with the New York Times, Mr. Brezinov poses the $32 billion question. Where is HUD and where's the money? It is the most important question, and a half a million people in public housing are urgently waiting for an answer. Federal disinvestment is symptomatic of an even deeper rot in American life, inequality. If one were searching for a place that symbolizes inequality in our own time, look no further than where I was born and raised, Throg's Neck, a publicly subsidized visual tale of two cities. In one city, there is corporate welfare for the powerful. In the other, callous disregard for the poor. Across the street from the sprawling NYCHA towers in the park is a gilded, gated golf course, Trump Links, which received over $100 million in public subsidy. Reflect on that for a moment. More dollars have been spent on a golf course for Donald Trump than on the homes of more than 3,000 New Yorkers for whom Throg's Neck houses is the only thing that stands between them and homelessness. If that inequality is not an indictment of how inefficiently and inhumanely we allocate resources and set priorities as a city and as a country, then I, for the life of me, could not imagine what would be. The scandal that took hold in Throg's Neck Houses, however, is as much about local mismanagement as it is about federal disinvestment. Indeed, it represents a profound failure of management at every level of the Housing Authority. The Department of Investigations found that the superintendent and a supervisor were engaged in a pattern of sabotaging appliances, abusing overtime, retaliating against subordinates, drinking in the workplace, and otherwise abusing the very power entrusted to them by the public. When one reads the DOI report, which describes the misconduct in disturbing detail, one cannot help but wonder how such an abusive environment could go so unnoticed for so long. Left unanswered in the DOI report is the essential question of who in NYCHA knew what when. Who in NYCHA first received complaints about the abusive workplace in Throg's Neck? When were those complaints received? What actions were taken in response to those complaints? Even more important than the facts of Throg's Neck are the largest systemic failures that plague public housing at large. 
Indeed, the DOI report not only exposes the egregious misconduct of a few rogue employees, for me, it raises deeper questions about NYCHA's management of personnel, property, and public funds. It is unclear whether employees, NYCHA employees, who fall victim to workplace abuses have a simple and streamlined mechanism by which to submit complaints without fear of retaliation. It is telling that as shocking as the abuses of Throgsneck houses were, few people said a word. Why is that? Fear, confusion, unresponsiveness from the higher-ups? Furthermore, it's unclear whether NYCHA has a real system in place for detecting, much less preventing, abuses in overtime and procurement. It is unclear whether NYCHA has a handle on the assets and equipment it manages. So much is unclear, which is why we are here to cut through the fog and get to the facts. As well as conducting oversight over DOI's investigative findings, we are hearing a number of bills. First, intro number 1239 would require the head of any mayoral agency or office to disclose to the Speaker of the Council, the Mayor, and the public any materially inaccurate statement that would mislead the public within sworn testimony made by an officer or an employee of such agency, or made in an official report within five days of the head of such agency obtaining knowledge of such statement. Second, intro 1331A uh, would require DOI to issue a monthly report to the council on total overtime hours recorded and total overtime paid to NYCHA employees for the prior calendar month. This information would be aggregated by borough and housing development and disaggregated by division, job title, and supervisory status. The bill would also direct DOI to report to the council on a bi-monthly basis any NYCHA contracts valued at or under $5,000 the report would include the dollar value of each contract, a description of the goods or services procured, the name and address of the vendor, and the date the contract was awarded. The report would be aggregated by borough and NYCHA housing development. Finally, we're hearing resolution number 676 by Council Member Salamanca. Of the first two previous bills are sponsored by myself, the resolution sponsored by Council Member Salamanca, which calls upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that would require NYCHA to conduct annual evaluations of agency property employees. NYCHA employees, including property managers, assistant managers, superintendents, and caretakers, are responsible for the overall operation of the 326 developments at NYCHA. Legislation requiring an annual evaluation would allow NYCHA to ensure that performance standards are being met. I would also like to thank our staff whose work made this hearing possible. Uh, Raymond Rodriguez from my office, Madiba, Denis, Jose Condi, and Daniel Collins from the Council's Legislative Division, and Steve Polnack and Justin Kramer from Oversight and Investigations Unit. I will now turn to Councilmember Amprey Samuel for an opening statement. Thank you, Chair Torres. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for being here today at today's joint hearing. I am Councilmember Lika Amprey Samuel, and I chair the Public Housing Committee. We are here today to discuss the incident at Throgs Neck Houses and the reforms that must occur in order to stamp out misconduct at NYCHA. Many of you are already familiar with the salacious details and inappropriate relationships between Throgs Neck managers and subordinates. Some employees were threatened and abused. Others were rewarded for their bad behavior, getting paid for overtime work when they were actually partying. All the while, repairs went undone and resident needs went unmet. Because of NYCHA's mismanagement, residents and employees both suffered. First, I must say that I can't believe that we are forced to conduct this hearing today. While the mayor brags about New York being the biggest, fairest city in America, we have city employees working in such a hostile and abusive work environment, I'm actually embarrassed. <clears throat> Chair Torres described the bills that we're hearing today. And I wanna just remind people that we had a management hearing about a year ago, the same committee, and a lot of, my colleagues discussed and complained about mismanagement in their developments. 
And I hope today we are much further along and that we won't hear, oh, we're working on it. We're putting something in place. We're going to release something in a couple of months. I really hope that that's not what we're going to hear today. We need to hear concrete results related to the report. NYCHA has an obligation to its workers and its residents. Misconduct and mistreatment like that which occurred at Throg's Neck should have never happened, and it cannot be allowed to happen again. The committee and members of the public here today must hear from NYCHA what steps has already been taken to respond to the report and its future plans to improve management and protect staff from abusive conduct. One of the managers in question reportedly bragged that he ran Throg's Neck like a jail. But Throg's Neck is a home and thousands of people live and work there. And they, like all NYCHA residents in New Yorkers, deserve better. And I also know that in the report, there was mention of a resident leader. As a strong advocate for residents and resident leaders, the highlighted portions of the DOI report that alleged behavior of an individual, I hope we will be able to have a conversation about that. But I wanna remind people too, that we're going to have an updated hearing about TPA and elections. And we should be able to go into detail about the mismanagement of TPA funds and elections and 964 regulations. But I hope that today's discussion will help guide that later hearing. And so with that, I just say thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Councilman Salamanca, would you like to make remarks about your resolution? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Torres and Chair Alika Apri Samuels. Um, the concept of my resolution is very simple. Performance evaluations for employees, annual performance evaluation for employees. Our NYCHA developments are in total disrepair. You know, we, I, I am aware that there is a $32 billion capital need, but there has been basic mismanagement that has gone on for decades. My constituents are suffering. Tickets are being opened, work is not being done, and tickets are being closed, and no one is being held accountable. No. A year ago, we had a hearing at the uh, city council chambers uh, where the leadership in NYCHA was explaining to us how, how many employees they have and how their operation works. Um, and a very basic question was asked, are property managers and ground workers, do they get an annual performance evaluation? And the answer was they get a, they are evaluated uh, their first, I believe their first year on the job um, as a form of uh, probation. And after that, evaluations are not being done. And so the question comes, how are they being held accountable? And I think the best way to hold them accountable is by having performance evaluations. So I am excited to have NYCHA here and DOI here so that we can ask these appropriate questions and see how we can get answers to them. Thank you. The first panel will be the Department of Investigations. We're joined by the Commissioner, Margaret Garnett. Um, will you please swear in the Commissioner. If you could please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Good morning, Chair Torres and Ambry Samuel and members of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations and Public Housing. My name is Margaret Garnett and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Investigation. I'm here today at both committees' requests to provide testimony about DOI's investigations into matters related to the Throgs Neck Houses, a New York City Housing Authority development in the Bronx. By way of background, DOI has 49 employees in its NYCHA Office of Inspector General, which oversees the city's public housing authority, including its operations, its 325 developments, and its 11,000 employees. Each year, DOI's IG for NYCHA receives over 2,000 complaints and reviews each one to assess whether the allegations fall under DOI's mandate to root out corruption, fraud, conflicts of interest, 
and gross misconduct, and of course, whether it is a potential criminal matter. Based on those complaints, as well as agency referrals and other sources of information, our NYCHA IG opens approximately 350 investigations each year. This protocol is the same for the thousands of complaints that come into DOI as a whole each year regarding the other city agencies we oversee, totaling more than 15,000 complaints in 2018 alone. DOI reviews each one individually and determines whether it is proper for a DOI investigation to be opened. We refer many administrative allegations and personnel matters back to the agencies we oversee. Complaints about matters such as relatively minor instances of employee time and leave abuse, employee misbehavior, and the daily management of the agency's business are all examples of issues that, in most instances, are most appropriately handled by the agency itself. Since agencies make their own managerial decisions, meet out employee discipline, and in NYCHA's case, have their own disciplinary units for employee misconduct. DOI is not and cannot be a replacement for an agency's management structure, its human resources office, or its EEO officer. Regarding the Throgsnick Houses development specifically, the initial complaints that we received involved allegations of rudeness to residents, drinking on the job, and consensual sexual relationships among employees. These kinds of complaints, while important, barring extreme allegations or circumstances that suggest the possibility of criminal conduct, endangering public safety, abuse of authority, or theft of city resources, are personnel matters which are most appropriately handled by the agency. The timeline of complaints about the Throgs Neck Houses specifically illustrates this typical procedure. In October of 2017, DOI's Office of NYCHA IG received an anonymous call complaining that Brianne Pawson, then a supervisor at the Throgs Neck Houses, was very rude to residents and employees and did not wear her NYCHA uniform as required while at work. We referred this complaint to NYCHA's Bronx Borough Management Department for action. In January of 2018, just a few months later, a NYCHA employee emailed the IG to complain that Brianne Pawson, the same supervisor, received favorable treatment as to various administrative matters because her father, Charles Pawson, was a director at NYCHA. We referred that complaint to NYCHA's chief administrative officer for action. As with all referrals like these, in both cases we included our standard language that if the agency finds any evidence of corrupt or criminal activity, DOI should be notified immediately. In the late spring of 2018, approximately a year ago, NYCHA General Manager Vito Mustacholo met with DOI's Inspector General for NYCHA, Ralph Iannuzzi, as part of a regularly scheduled meeting between DOI and NYCHA. Among the many items discussed at that spring meeting was information that General Manager Mustachulo had received alleging that some Throgs Neck Houses staff were drinking alcohol at work and having sex with other NYCHA employees at work. Those complaints did not allege criminal activity but were employee misconduct allegations that absent other aggravating factors would typically be handled by the agency as a managerial or human resources matter. As with the earlier complaints, at this point the complaints were unfortunately neither unusual nor out of the mainstream of employee misconduct complaints that DOI typically receives about NYCHA. As a result, IGI Nutsi told NYCHA that the matter should be addressed by the agency as a management issue, and if NYCHA became aware of any potential criminal conduct or corruption-related aggravating factors, again, they should alert DOI immediately. NYCHA subsequently reported to DOI that it had immediately opened an internal investigation that included conducting unannounced visits at the Throgs Neck Houses, interviewing staff and residents, and reviewing CCTV camera footage, among other actions. General Manager Mustachulo had just started at NYCHA approximately four months earlier. He has consistently been receptive to DOI's oversight role. The conversations between him and Inspector General Iannuzzi continue to be active and open on this matter through the summer. While NYCHA's internal investigation was ongoing, DOI received two additional relevant complaints. In June of 2018, we received an anonymous complaint that Throgs Neck Supervisors Wallace Farine and Ricardo Ramos had sexual relationships with a number of female employees on the caretaker staff at Throgs Neck, and that these employees had then received favorable treatment from Ramos and Varine. In early August of 2018, a NYCHA employee reported to DOI that Brianne Pawson had hosted parties with staff during working hours that included alcohol and marijuana use, 
and that she was having consensual sexual relationships with male subordinates. Because of the nature of the allegations and our awareness of NYCHA's ongoing inquiry into staff misconduct at Throg's Neck, we referred the complaints to NYCHA management, in one case directly to Mr. Mustachulo, with our standard proviso that any evidence of criminality or corruption should be immediately reported back to DOI. By midsummer, in several conversations during July and August of last year, NYCHA reported back to DOI that while it had not been able to substantiate specific allegations of employee misconduct at the Throgs Neck Houses, NYCHA management had determined that there were numerous managerial problems at the development that needed prompt and aggressive action. These problems included unacceptable delays in maintenance and repairs and a pattern of excessive overtime use. As a result, NYCHA management had decided to transfer the entire staff of 45 employees to other developments. General Manager Mustachulo discussed this plan with Inspector General Iannuzzi and his staff, and there was mutual agreement that the staff transfers would hopefully stem further problems and potentially create an environment where other complainants among both residents and staff would feel comfortable coming forward with information, whether related to the prior allegations or regarding new allegations. That plan worked, and it worked swiftly on multiple levels. On August 24, 2018, NYCHA executed the transfer plan, and in the immediate aftermath, more complainants promptly came forward to report additional misconduct at the Throgs Neck Houses. Simultaneously, the media reported on the complete staff transfer at the development, as well as publishing a number of additional allegations ranging from sexual harassment by supervisors of subordinates to group sex parties that involved residents and children, overtime abuses, and the assertion by Throgs Neck Tenants Association President Monique Johnson that there was video and audio evidence of employees having sex on NYCHA property. New complainants coming forward and the seriousness and specificity of their new allegations, as well as the new allegations outlined in the media that identified potential criminal conduct, all led DOI to open its own investigation at the end of August of 2018. We conducted over 40 interviews of employees and residents, reviewed video recordings and photographs, personnel files, timesheets, purchasing records, work orders, phone records, and numerous other documents. Our thorough and independent investigation refuted claims that Throg's next staff were having what had been described as orgies both on and off NYCHA premises. Significantly and thankfully, DOI found no evidence of alleged sex parties or sexual misconduct involving residents or children at the Throgs Neck Houses. Indeed, in the course of DOI's investigation, Tenant Association President Johnson and other Tenants Association officers recanted the allegations they had made to the media about personally witnessing parties, drinking, or sexual misconduct, and the existence of recorded evidence of this behavior. However, we did, as both chairs alluded to, find extremely troubling evidence of a culture of misconduct, employee mistreatment and retaliation led by the two managers at the site, Brianne Pawson and Wallace Vereen. DOI's findings are described in detail in our six-page letter to NYCHA that was sent in January and is attached to my testimony and I believe all the council members should have that before them today. Those findings included regular and extensive alcohol use on the job. Managers and subordinates engaged in sexual relationships that led to improper favoritism and punishment. Managers threatening of subordinates' physical safety. Managers allowing favored employees to leave their assigned posts while on duty. Time and leave abuse. Bullying and retaliation against disfavored employees. Sabotage of NYCHA appliances intended for residents' apartments. Discarding thousands of dollars worth of valuable NYCHA equipment. And the circumvention of NYCHA's procurement rules. Moreover, all of this misconduct took place in an atmosphere of perceived impunity on the part of Vereen and Pawson, which suppressed complaints by both residents and NYCHA staff. The matter was referred to NYCHA to take appropriate disciplinary action, which NYCHA promptly initiated. Those disciplinary proceedings are currently in progress against both Pawson and Vereen. In the course of our investigation to employee misconduct at the Throgs Neck Houses, Numerous witnesses reported to DOI that Monique Johnson abuses her position as the president of the Throgs Neck Tenants Association. Our investigation found that Johnson had for years inappropriately diverted NYCHA staff time and funding for Tenants Association purposes, depriving all Throgs Neck residents of needed resources. 
For example, DOI found that Johnson had NYCHA pay a private contractor nearly $5,000 to install private security cameras for her Tenants Association office and special order a stove for the Tenants Association office using scarce funds from Throg's next general budget, which is intended to pay for appliances and equipment for the use of all residents. Additionally, Johnson received special renovations in her own apartment that would not be available to other residents. We concluded that Johnson was able to get this special and unwarranted treatment, in part through threats and intimidation. Finally, we found evidence that the Throgs Neck Tenants Association may be operating contrary to the Department of Housing and Urban Development regulations and its own bylaws. DOI's full report concerning the Throgs Neck Tenants Association was sent to NYCHA in early February and is attached to my testimony, and I believe all council members have that as well. DOI recommended that NYCHA conduct a comprehensive review of the Throgs Neck Tenants Association's compliance with HUD regulations, NYCHA policies, and its own bylaws. We also recommended reforms to ensure the integrity of NYCHA staff interactions with tenants associations throughout the city, including providing both development staff and borough management with written instruction that tenants association requests may not be prioritized over other residents' needs. The allegations we investigated here tracked a 2013 DOI investigation that began after NYCHA's then general manager, Cecil House, referred complaints to us that Johnson, then also in her role as Tenants Association President, was intimidating and threatening the NYCHA staff and residents. That 2013 investigation found that Johnson frequently created a, quote, disruptive atmosphere for the Throgs Neck management employees by demanding information and attempting to intimidate staff through aggression and hostility, and that her frequent presence in the management office is excessive, often unwarranted, and inappropriate, end quote. That 2013 investigation also determined that NYCHA borough management personnel advocated for Johnson personally in a way that circumvented NYCHA's procedures. It appears that NYCHA management took no action in response to our 2013 investigation and referral. However, our experience has been that the new NYCHA administration is responding seriously and appropriately to our 2019 referral. After receiving our February letter, NYCHA management requested our 2013 referral letter as well so that it can review the matter's history. I have personally reviewed the investigations DOI conducted in these matters and our handling of the earlier complaints. I am proud of our work here. The investigations were thorough and independent, and the detailed findings and ultimate referrals to NYCHA management were based on the facts, not rumors or unsubstantiated allegations. Although our investigations revealed very troubling conduct at Throg's Neck, most of it was not criminal. In the few areas where misconduct was arguably or potentially criminal, the evidence was not sufficient to support a criminal prosecution. Within the tenure of General Manager Mustachulo, NYCHA has acted promptly on both the allegations and the ultimate findings. NYCHA's own internal investigation in consultation with DOI led to the managerial decision to transfer all of the staff out of the Throgs Neck development. That decision created conditions that contributed to the success of DOI's subsequent investigation. Based on our findings, NYCHA is taking disciplinary action against the two most senior employees involved in the misconduct. In addition, our recommendations regarding the Tenants Association speak to essential improvements needed in that area as well. We expect that NYCHA will follow up appropriately and we will continue to monitor this area of operations. I believe that DOI's comprehensive investigations have led to the beginnings of reform at NYCHA's Throgs Neck Houses, reforms that will hopefully inform NYCHA's management of other developments and improve conditions for both residents and staff. I look forward to continuing our work in this area. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to answer any questions the council members have. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. It was uh, detailed that it answered actually a number of questions that I had. Uh, so judging by your testimony, it seems that DOI had been receiving complaints about misconduct at the Rosnack houses since October of 2017. Yes, that's, that's a new fact that had not been previously. Yeah, the first complaint that we received that was specifically about the employees that were later the subject of the investigation or that referenced the kind of misconduct that was ultimately uncovered, we received in October of 2017. And that, as I said, focused primarily on 
Ms. Paulson's um, rudeness or inappropriate interactions with residents and staff and the fact that she did not wear her uniform at work. So over the course of almost a year, DOI received complaints about various complaints, widely varied complaints about misconduct at Throgs Neck Houses. At what point did you receive the most detailed complaint about misconduct at Throgs Neck Houses? Um, I, I would say the detailed, excuse me, the detailed information did not come to light until we began our own investigation in late August of 2018. I, I think w one thing that is important to understand um, about the situation is that because of, I think, the culture that had been created by Pawson and Vereen, and because of the impression um, on the part of lower level staff and some residents that complaining was essentially pointless, that nothing would be done, that they had a kind of immunity, no, either that they were perceived as immune or that no one cared. I, I don't want to, um, I think the, the impressions ran that gamut. Um, the transfer of the staff, the strong action taken by NYCHA management to remove the entirety of the staff at that development, what we saw is that really created a space where people felt more safe and supported. But, but, but I had something else in mind. Okay. I know obviously more facts came to light as you began the investigation and undertook the investigation. I'm curious, what, what tips before the investigation uh, was the most detailed and, and ultimately prompted your decision to conduct an investigation into Rocks Neck Houses? I don't think it's fair to say it was any one tip. So as I said, we had received... Um, I'll be more specific. There sure. was a reference to, uh, in, just a quote from your testimony, early August 2018, a NYCHA employee reported to DOI that Brianna Pawson had hosted parties with staff during working hours that included alcohol and marijuana use, and that she was having consensual, consensual sexual relationships with male subordinates. Was, was that the most detailed tip that you had yes. received Pri about misconduct? Yes. Prior to the start of our investigation, that was the most detailed information, yes. And I guess the question is, is what point does DOI investigate, right? You know, corruption is straightforward. Fraud is straightforward. But there's mention of abuse. Whenever I see a public awareness campaign by DOI, when you see corruption, fraud, or abuse, contact DOI. So at what point is abuse egregious enough to justify a DOI investigation? If you learn of a supervisor who is sleeping with employees, mm -hmm. who's abusing her power during work time, who's using drugs, who's drinking, that's not, those are not simply isolated incidents of misconduct. That could point to a culture of abuse. So, so why was that not sufficient to justify a DOI investigation before the scandal broke publicly? So I think you have to, I, I agree with you that I think the area of what we could broadly call employee misconduct is, is more of a gray area and it's a totality of the circumstances. You know, it's hard to have a bright line, unlike for corruption, bribery, uh, outright theft of city money or resources, the area of employee misconduct is more of a totality of the circumstances area. It's harder to have bright line rules. In this case, I think that I would put the August 2018 complaint in context of where at, at that stage we had been having ongoing conversations with Mr. Masachulo from late spring through August. We knew that NYCHA was undertaking, frankly in a way that is different from how things might have been handled in the past, that the general manager Masachulo was engaged in a very aggressive internal investigation into these allegations. Um, and that they were on the cusp of taking action against employees at the development. So I think that we might have had that August 2018 complaint come in in isolation. If the question is, in isolation, would that complaint have been enough to cause us to open investigation? Maybe. I think the fact that it was, we already knew at that point um, of the status of NYCHA's own investigation, that it was coming to a close, that we were in discussions with NYCHA about what they intended to do with regard to Throg's Neck. So um, once they had decided that the appropriate thing would be a wholesale transfer of the staff to other developments, that decision was in part driven by a sense that there was more there and that doing something like that would 
create an environment where people would come forward with more detailed information. But here's how I, and I, I think this is a close call, right? Um, some of the coverage that I've read in the Daily News suggested that DOI dropped the ball, but as you correctly point out, there's no bright line. But DOI did receive complaints about the Rock Stack houses since October of 2017. The general manager thought the issue was serious enough to bring it directly mm -hmm. to the attention of the NYCHA IG. The August 2018 tip did point to serious abuses on the part of the supervisor, sex with employees, drug use, drinking during work time. Th those are not simply isolated instances of abuse. Those, those could point to a culture of abuse. And I would make one more point. If, if I'm a supervisor at Throck's Neck Houses and I'm sleeping with my employees and I'm drinking during working hours, it's probably the case that I'm engaged in other forms of misconduct that more squarely fall within the realm of the jurisdiction of DOI. W was, there, was there any investigation into the overtime abuse, right, based on, based on the tips that you, you had received about? So we had not received um, tips to the NYCHA IG about overtime abuse. Um, actually, General Manager Masachulo raised those concerns with us first in the summer of 2018. You know, I would say that at the time we received the August 2018 complaint, which was the more detailed. Oh, so you, so, uh, there w so before the investigation began, DOI did receive complaints about possible overtime abuse? Yeah, so, so General Manager Masachulo was engaged in, he was keeping us informed in the summer of 2018 about NYCHA's own investigation and what they were learning about what was going on at Throg's Neck. I think it's always a balance on but that, that strikes me as actually more clear cut. Like overtime abuse involves the mismanagement of public funds. DOI was founded in the in the wake of Tammany Hall, right. which was about mismanagement of public funds. Shouldn't that been sufficient to prompt some preliminary investigation into Throg's Neck houses? Or? Yes, but NYCHA was engaged in its own review of those matters at the time that we were made aware that that was a potential issue. And ultimately they did find that there was a pattern of excessive overtime use. And our investigation was open when it became clear that the two things, when it became clear that the abuses were more extensive and also that NYCHA had essentially reached a wall in its own internal investigation, the NYCHA management had, that then it was time for us to step in. And we did that very promptly at the end of August in 2018. Uh, again, we, we all, wisdom, <laughs> I have the benefit of 2020 hindsight, right? But just based on if there are allegations of overtime abuse, right? And if there are multiple tips that suggest a culture of abuse at a particular development, it seems to me that referral might not have been the best option, that DOI should have investigated the matter. But that could be a respectful point of disagreement. Um, yeah, I think, again, this situation has to be viewed in context. At the time that the more specific allegations came in in the summer of 2018, what, we're not talking at that point about simply a referral letter that, hey, here's this thing, f follow up on it. The context at that time was one that we knew that NYCHA management was in fact taking action, was keeping us informed about their management actions they were taking and the results of their own investigation. So I think it was appropriate for us to allow that process to play out. We had confidence they were taking aggressive steps to identify what the issues were and take action. Um, and then at the appropriate time, we took over from there. The question, so left, left unanswered in the report is the question of who in NYCHA knew what when. So who in NYCHA was the first person to receive a complaint about the misconduct at Throck's Neck Houses? Um, so the, a couple of things that we know for sure. One is that the October 2017 complaint and the January 2018 complaints that were received by us were referred to the appropriate high-level management at NYCHA. Um, we also learned in our investigation that um, one of the sort of lowest level caretaker employees at Throg's Neck uh, told us that he had reported to the regional manager. Um, you, I know you understand this, but everyone yeah. might not, that there, there are borough, there's a borough yeah. management head and then each three, borough. Three levels of management. Right. Each borough is broken up into regional managers that have multiple developments. So. One um, of the lower level caretaker employees told us that he had, I believe in the spring of 2018, 
um, reported to the regional manager that some complaints about Brianne Pawson. Um, in our investigation, uh, we spoke to that regional manager, and he said that he, he acknowledged receiving the complaints, but that he didn't feel there was enough specific information to take action. Um, that was his view. Then I would say one other issue that is important to flag here is that for nearly a year, so from the fall of 2017 until the mass transfer in August of 2018, um, Thorax Neck has had no on-site manager. So you refer to three levels of management. Each development has a manager of the development who's the highest level supervisor that's on-site. So for almost a year before this, there was no, that position was vacant at Throg Snack. You made reference to reforms that NYCHA is making in the wake of the Rock Snack houses. What are those reforms that you're referencing? So I think um, one thing that's sort of harder to put a number on, but we have certainly seen the results of um, as far as systemic changes and reforms is that um, I think there has been, our experience has been a culture at NYCHA of people not feeling safe or supported to come forward, a perception that um, a perception that nothing will be done and you can complain but it's sort of they go into the wind and nothing will be done and I think that through a variety of mechanisms including this mass transfer of all employees and the strong action taken ultimately taken at Throg's Neck um, is part of changing that culture and the messaging what we have seen in the wake of that transfer is a real uptick in complaints coming in or reports being made by NYCHA employees to our IG's office, including some that specifically say, like, you know, if you, I know you are looking at Throg's Neck and, you know, if you think Throg's Neck is bad, you should let me tell you about what's going on where I work. Um, and we have seen a noticeable increase um, in those complaints and reports coming from NYCHA employees, which to us is a sign that the work to change that culture um, is is having an effect. Um, in fact, we had a case recently um, that was reported in the press of an employee at the Wagner Houses who had stolen um, essentially an entire kitchen from NYCHA and installed it in her own apartment with NYCHA money and employees. Um, and that complaint came in in the wake, the complaint that started that investigation came in in the wake of the Throg's Neck mass transfer with a reference to the fact that, you know, this something like that is going on here and we investigated and she was charged. Um, Council Member, I appreciate it. Uh, just quick, we've been joined by Council Member Traeger. Uh, the majority leader was here. I'm sorry, uh, not the, I'm sorry. Council, form, form, uh, Council Member Van Bramer. I'm um, still in my first term. <laughs> Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Ayala, and I believe that's it. So I have several questions related to um, the end of your report when you go into detail about the resident association leader, Ms. Johnson is a significant piece of your testimony. How do you investigate complaints against a resident leader? Well, I think it depends on what the nature of those complaints is. So um, we, had, we do occasionally, um, I asked our staff to go back and see what had been the history, say, within the last, um, I, I frankly can't remember if it was the last five years or last 10 years, but some period to see, to canvas our complaint database for what are the kinds of complaints that we receive about tenants associations or residents associations in other, across all of NYCHA. And um, I'm happy to say that the overwhelming majority, there was a relatively small number, the overwhelming majority of those complaints were unsubstantiated. Um, I think that here, because the complaints involved misuse of NYCHA resources, um, inappropriate actions towards NYCHA staff that interfered with their ability to do their jobs, allegations of special favors or special treatment um, from NYCHA, some relatively senior management, um, that we did think those allegations merited investigation and we substantiated them in both 2013 and 2019. 
Okay, so when you mentioned um, allegations from the staff about them b being unable to do their work, um, can you just explain to me, like just in the context of this particular investigation, because here it is we're talking about um, property managers who were not doing their job appropriately, and then we're talking about a resident leader who essentially was like a, a whistleblower in a sense where she made her own complaints against um, the staffing um, um, or just speaking on behalf of residents or if residents made complaints about the mismanagement and there's a whole hearing right now about the inappropriate behaviors at um, Throg's Neck. Can, can you articulate to us um, how this is not or the possibility of retaliation where NYCHA staff is saying that um, a resident leader acted inappropriately and filed all these different complaints because, um, you know, she might have just been a thorn in their side or like a pain in the neck. And I say that because there's been a culture of retaliation um, within NYCHA and um, towards the residents. Mm -hmm. And when there is a resident leader who is very um, maybe aggressive or um, um, patched, thank you. okay, thank you. Um, there's been some retaliation. And so can you um, explain to us how you are able to conduct an investigation that is fair and receiving information that is vetted um, f um, outside of employees who may feel disgruntled? So I I'm very confident that this investigation was not uh, I, I don't doubt, I, I will say I have no doubt that because it has it has happened and not just yes. that the and 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 we know personally resident leaders who have complained to us about their property managers and when a complaint is filed against a property manager they are then targeted mm -hmm. and so I just want you to be able to explain to us what other um, um, information you receive to to come up with your findings yeah so I, I I don't doubt and I think that ties in with what I said before that part of the systemic problems at NYCHA is a perception on the part of both residents and staff that, that if they complain they'll be silenced or retaliated against or that no one will care or do anything so I, I don't doubt at all um, you know based on talking to our folks that what you're saying in a more broad way is correct that there have been instances of retaliation that is not the case here for a couple of reasons one is that um, our the a number of the findings in 2019 are similar to those that we found in 2013 that NYCHA did not act on and essentially left in place um, a tenant association leader who continued to engage in misconduct and be abusive to both re other residents and staff at NYCHA, that the findings that are reflected in our 2019 letter are not about a resident association leader who's advocating for other residents. They're about a resident association leader who's taking advantage of corrupt supervisors to get special benefits for herself. So I think the situation here is that the the complaints that we were dealing with were about Pawson and Vereen. Those complaints were substantiated at length in our January letter. That what we found in following up on the complaints from both residents and staff about Ms. Johnson's conduct were that what had happened is that instead of complaining about Pawson and Vereen, uh, as maybe should have been done, that Ms. Johnson was taking advantage of their corruption to get benefits for herself. Um, and I think we detail those at, with some specificity in, in the letter. So the, the substantiation that we were able to do of some of those things was um, documented. It's not just about people saying things in an interview, but corroboration of what they were saying, including um, the security cameras, the special stove that was in a locked area only for Ms. Johnson and other officers, and it, uh, repairs or renovations in her apartment that would not have been available to other residents. Um, that there's no question that those things happened and that they were improper. So because we're in, in this hearing and in this context, um, because I would hate for 
for there to feel like there's a, a like a, a, a target on a resident leader and would cause um, other residents to not want to um, to step out and and you know do the right thing or or work on on behalf of advocating for their neighbors um, because there's a potential for them to get in trouble. Um, I, I mean, I, I, sh I share that concern, and I can assure you that we will have no part and, and, and in retaliating against residents who, who raise mm -hmm. issues about this. And not to ha – so I'm not and, – and y'all forgive me. I'm not trying to, ha like, just take up too much time and in, in, in hammering out this point. But so I know that there are resident um, rooms that have a stove in them, right? And um, – and I know that there were opportunities for NYCHA to be able to work with the residents on procuring different things for their offices or, you know, to be able to be helpful. And NYCHA lacked that particular, um, I don't want to say skill set, but they were not able to do what they were supposed to do to be supportive of the resident leaders as it pertains to them procuring different things in a, um, a timely fashion for their offices to be able to do whatever. If it's televisions, if it's cameras, if it's stoves, if it's, you know, different things to be able to have a, a, an environment where residents can come and then be engaged and work on behalf of the people. NYCHA has not been able to provide them with that level of support. And so they have been forced to do things on their own. And so were you able to take into account some of the um, like systemic uh, problems that they've had with the, the, the TPA process? And, and I know that they you documented the election process and you know, was there a, a board in place and different things. Um, residents have a way of trying to make a way out of no way. Mm -hmm. And were you able to incorporate that in your investigation and your findings as opposed to just seeing what the rules may be and see it as something that is, um, you know, well, this is black and white. This is what you were supposed to do, was not supposed to do. And so therefore you're wrong because you, NYCHA purchased a, a stove and you should have used your TPA funds to purchase that stove. And so, it, I, I'm sorry, I don't, sense? yes. Um, I think that it is undoubtedly true that the TPA process is, is complicated. We did not undertake a comprehensive review of whether NYCHA is properly making TPA funds available to residents association throughout the system. I think we certainly highlight it in the report and refer to NYCHA that they should undertake a review of the broader relationship between NYCHA staff and tenants associations around the system. What, what I would say in, in this case is that, again, and this is why I um, asked the staff at the NYCHA IG to, to pull for our discussion the history of any other complaints that we had received um, in the last several years about other, you know, any other uh, resident leader or residence association officer. Um, or residents association throughout the system. And as with the employee, so the employee report here was reflected the, broadly speaking, the categories of misconduct that unfortunately are relatively common throughout NYCHA, but a very extreme example of that. A terrorized environment, an extreme level of misconduct. Um, and I think it's also fair to say that the situation that we reported on involving Ms. Johnson and her conduct and the kinds of benefits that she had received and frankly the leveraging of um, corrupt supervisors at NYCHA to get benefits for herself was also a very extreme example of um, what I think you're referring to, which is some of the day in, day out difficulties that uh, resident leaders have in um, getting satisfactory interactions with the supervisors at their development. So. I, I'm definitely sympathetic, and I know my staff is very knowledgeable about some of these issues that you're referring to. Um, respectfully, I do not think the situation is an example of that. Can I quickly? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I want to. I obviously, I, I did not. At first, I should note, in the interest of full disclosure, I've known Monique Johnson for 10 years, as first as a staffer of Councilman Jerry Vaca, and now as a council member myself. So just. 
But I guess the question is not whether there's retaliation. The question is, is there a concern about a chilling effect on advocacy from public housing residents? And without commenting on the allegations, because I don't know, you know, I tr DOI conducted an investigation. I respect your investigative findings. But, you know, it's one thing to publish a report against an agency. That's fair game. Or publish a report against a public official like me, right? I, I know what I'm getting into. I know what I'm signing up for. But, but a, a tenant leader is ultimately a civilian, right? And, and that report was, was written by, about by the Daily News, the, the New York Post. And there's no real opportunity to respond to those investigative findings within a report. Is, is that, I'm struggling with this question, but th there's, there's irreparable reputational damage yes. that comes from a DOI report against a, a person who's ultimately a civilian. Is that, is that, is that a factor at all? Or? So our, our referral letters to agencies are subject to FOIL, as this one was. Yeah. Um, the, the sort of some of the FOIL exemptions, I'm not an expert on FOIL, my general counsel is, he'll, she'll jump up if I get it wrong, but there are categories of FOIL exemptions that relate to some of the issues that you're talking about. In this case, I think part of the consideration is that Ms. Johnson had put herself um, in the public eye, identified herself in this role, t said things to the press that were not true. We were asked to investigate them and we did. So the normal, I, I think some of the considerations for a purely private citizen where none of these issues had been, had been publicly aired by the choice of the person involved, that the, the drawing of that line might have been a little bit different. Um, but here the findings were contained in a referral letter that went to NYCHA. We, we frequently get FOIL requests from the press, from elected officials, from the citizens for our findings. And the default is that our findings are foilable once they go to another agency, with some exceptions. Uh, Councilmember Diaz. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Councilmember Samuel sir, uh, spoke of a culture of retaliation. Yeah. Yes, we have that. Talk to me about it. Uh, let me ask you a question because I'm reading your report said, said that uh, Mrs. the tenant president, Ms. Johnson, no, before that, a tenant association, if that is composed of tenant residents of people from the outside? It, it's composed of people who live in the development. A, a Trugnet, Trugnet Tenant Association was composed of Ms. Johnson relative of, or, or tenants? Um, every, if, if I understand correctly, every officer of the Throgs Act Tenants Association is supposed to be a Throgs Neck Houses resident. The, the rules require so the, that the officers of the Tenants Association be residents in the development. So the Tenants Association primary job is to look up and, be sh and provide a, a good environment and to work in behalf of the tenants resident. Yes. They're supposed to work on behalf of all tenants. So when you say Ms. Johnson inappropriately, inappropriately diverted, diverted NYCHA staff and funding resources, how, what are we talking about? What are you talking about? There are different pots of money uh, in NYCHA. There are money that is a general fund that's intended to be used for all residents, not merely those who are involved in the Tenants Association or officers of it. Um, then there is money that's set aside to be used for uh, the Tenants Association in particular. Tenants Association officers are eligible for monthly stipends that um, are intended to compensate them for time that they spend working on the association. There's a variety of different buckets of money. What went on here is a diversion of money from the general fund that's intended to be spent to, on things that are available for the use of all residents, and they were spent instead on things that were accessible with that, with, with that, with, for the with, use of only a few with, people. That money was not used for, per, for personal purposes. Well, some staff time was used for personal purposes. Such as? Such as renovations to Ms. Johnson's apartment that would not have been available to other residents. Oh, what renovations? 
Yeah. What's for renovation? Could you Including spend? painting, painting her bathroom. But and that's other that's that's part of the, that's part of that's part of the job. Sorry, oh, shh. Ain't that? Now let me let me another one. When she say she spent five thousand dollars to install uh, a private security camera for ten association office. The the contractor was related to Ms. Johnson? No, I don't I don't think so, no. It was a private contractor. Did she produce documentation that the money was used appropriately? The 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 money that was spent on that isn't was not supposed to be spent for that purpose. Well, no, that's not my question. Okay, my question is did she produce paperwork that the money was uh the money that she used for the for to to to, to pay the the contractor to install the camera, did she produce money uh, documentation that that was done accurately? The the procurement process was handled by NYCHA, corrupt mm. NYCHA supervisors at Throgsnack. It was not handled by Miss Johnson personally. Mm. So, and, and and the camera was uh, installed in the office of the. The tenant association, not in Miss Johnson apartment. That's right. Okay, so uh, another question here: Is it uh, Tron Neck General Budget uh, Johnson received special renovation in her, in her apartment? You said that the special treatment that she got was that she got painted. The apartment was painted, the and the bathroom was fixed. No, just the bathroom. No, no, you can. That, that she got paid, uh, the apartment was painted or the bathroom, and she got the bathroom fixed? The one, sp the one specific situation that I'm aware, sitting here right now, can say is that Ms. Johnson had her apartment I'm gonna, painted a special I'm going to end, I'm going to end, thank you, Ms. Chairman, but I'm going by saying that instead of painting a criminal here, I see a heck of a leader in Ms. Johnson's action to provide services and to be sure that the office, see, I'm a city council. You know the first thing that I did when I got elected? Be sure that my office looks nice. Look, because when the people come in my office, they would like to have a nice environment, be nice. No, 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 a, a crap uh, uh, that people don't even want to come. So Miss Johnson, I, I see her a heck of a leader. I, I, she should be commended by, 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 by providing uh, a decent, secure, play office for the for the tenants to come and use, not not to be condemned the way it's been, she's been condemned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Diaz. I want to acknowledge the presence of Councilmember Yeager and uh, Councilmember John. Do you have any questions or comments since you represent the Rockstack Houses? Thank you, Chairs. Um, Throgsneck uh, Housing. Fortunately uh, and unfortunately, falls in my district. Firsthand, I've seen the uh, needs and the mismanagement of Throg's Neck. And when we often refer to the tale of two cities, I can't help but refer to the tale of two tenants that we have in New York City, and that is tenants that reside in private dwellings with landlords and the tenants that we have living in substandard conditions uh, of NYCHA properties. In Commissioner, one of the questions that immediately comes to mind to me is the 2,000 complaints that you receive or your office receives on an annual basis, mm -hmm. which breaks down to about using the number of employees, one in five employees, using these stats broadly, of course, or six complaints per complex for fraud, mismanagement, and other abuses. What's more disturbing is that one out of every six of these complaints leads to an investigation, according to the statement that you made. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't help but think how many more complaints don't get reported. So when we refer to this culture these are disturbing stats. And the number of 2,000 
is roughly an average of what period of time? That's in a calendar year. So in a calendar year, we receive between 2,000 and 2,500 complaints. Some, some, and I, I should be clear that some portion of those end up, they come into us, but they really are, you know, um, not necessarily about NYCHA and not necessarily appropriate for us. So it may be from a NYCHA resident, but the complaint is really about the garbage or, you know, some, some issue that they, they call us but it's not, the complaint is not actually about NYCHA. So, um, and then of those that remain, we either, if they are related to a NYCHA employee or tenant, we would either refer them to NYCHA or to some other appropriate city agency, or we would handle it ourselves. And of the roughly 2,000, on average, about 350 in a calendar year result in a, us opening an investigation ourselves. Which seems quite high to me. Uh, and first of all, a tremendous undertaking for your office and limited staff. The question first is, do you have enough staff to meet the needs and investigations of NYCHA, let alone the other responsibilities that uh, for the city? Um, well, we always would welcome more resources. Um, and I think you know we have the budget cycle coming up to talk about that. I think that our um, a, a bigger issue, which our current management has been very receptive to, is our concerns about salary freezes and underpayment of investigators that work in the IG's office. I think the current management has been very receptive and responsive to our concerns about that. The um, You probably know this, uh, Councilman Joni, but others may not, that um, the staff of our NYCHA IG is part of DOI, but they are paid by, their salaries are paid by NYCHA. Um, so, I think our, the IG's office has done a really outstanding job, in my view, of managing the investigations they open. So um, we open around, on average, 350 a year. We close between 300 and 350 a year. So they are moving those cases. I think we always um, welcome additional resources. It's always helpful. But um, I think they are doing a very good job of managing those cases. Commissioner, that's one per day, seven days a week almost. That includes weekends and holidays. Yes, sir. Um, and we are at budget time. Um, what is the dollar amount that comes out of the NYCHA budget for uh, investigations of this independent? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but I bet Mr. Iannuzzi knows. <coughs> Um, it's approximately three and a half million dollars for personal services to pay the salaries. You know, of that's the pretty remarkable that we use three and a half million dollars uh, from the NYCHA's general fund uh, to instead of it going to the tenants and the needed repairs uh, and maintenance of our properties, uh, we're spending it on some chair. I, we should look into this and figure out how I, we can. I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, if there are construction projects and you want to monitor corruption, quality control, you do need investigators to ensure that there's no corruption in the agency. Right, but having to come out of the NYCHA's budget Fair enough. Ve uh, versus the commissioner's budget. And, and it, it's worth noting that. that the office of the NYCHA IG is far less, receives far fewer resources than comparable IGs elsewhere in city government. So, uh, so looking into that, I think would be a yeah. good start. Um, I do want to continue the uh, discussions of mismanagement. And recently I've heard the term NYCHA CARES is a program that uh, we've developed that this administration has put into play to make it look or assume that we're actually doing what's supposed to be done and people are being held accountable and responsible. So there's an old saying, you know, you make like you care and I'll make like I really work hard and care. Um, and this is top down. Uh, it's unfortunate, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, in particular at the Throgs Neck housing uh, facility and outside of the reports and allegations, uh, those conditions of that property is deplorable, inside and outside. And I don't want to deviate too far from the needs of, the, of those residents and what they're subjected to on a daily basis, the 3,000 residents, which is a good portion of the people I represent day in and day out the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable uh, that are subjected to these conditions have also been so undermined and beaten down and mistreated and abused 
that they no longer can fight for themselves and they've accepted this dark, grim lifestyle. And when they have a passionate tenant leader like Monique Johnson, and I've been on that end of the receiving end of her passion many a times. I can say from gas, gas outages to elevator breakdowns and lack of repairs. And I bring up gas outage for a particular reason. Because in 2017, one whole, uh, several buildings within the complex, like 60 apartments were shut down for a gas leak. And we made sure that those residents were not forced to go out of their pockets to go out and dine, something that they could not afford and uh, not be able to cook at home was a terrible financial burden on them. And I remember reaching out to local restaurants to send food over, make donations, uh, which was served within the uh, TA office. And that stove was being used to heat that food that was being served to the tenants that had no cooking gas, that were given these hot plates that couldn't warm up food for their families. And I attended there one evening and there were dozens and dozens of residents standing on line so they can get food to feed themselves and their families. And I also know that the stove that was installed was an electric stove versus a gas stove. Am I correct on this or maybe? I don't know. I do know that was not the purpose of the purchase right. of the stove. I'm sorry? I, I, I do know that feeding general te tenants in the event of a gas outage was not the purpose of the purchase of that stove. So I don't, I don't doubt anything you're saying, right. but I don't think it casts into question the findings of our report. Okay. I... See, I've been in that office a few times. Uh, seen the families that were there eating. And it was heartwarming for me first to be able to know I made a difference. And second, know that they could get nourishment in, a, uh, in an environment where they can provide for themselves and their families. Um, was quite touching for me. And also sad that we had to, had to succumb to such options uh, for them. Uh, but I know that uh, because of my background as well, electric stoves are more expensive than gas stoves. Uh, and I believe uh, in this particular case, an electric stove was warranted because of the gas outages that are frequently experienced throughout NYCHA. And these are whole tenement buildings. Um, but is, it, is that something similar that's found in other TA offices where there are stoves? Is this uh, something rare? Some, as, as I understand it, some TA offices have a, they, they're going to differ from development to development. Mm -hmm. Again, the issue here was the use of funds that are not authorized to outfit tenant associate. There are funds available for that. <laughs> and other tenants association in, in other developments have used those funds. That's not where the money came from, nor were the rules for NYCHA procurement followed. The procedure that occurred was done as a special favor for Ms. Johnson at thank, her request. Thank you for that explanation. Wouldn't it have been more appropriate then for the management to say, sorry, you have funds for this, please apply through X, we can't accommodate your request? Yes, that would have been more appropriate. And I would imagine then the tenant president would have said, okay, I've got to figure out another means to do this. And I'm not looking... A, a person could have responded that way, yes. Right. And similar question for the security system. Is this something unorthodox that's not found at any other uh, NYCHA tenant president, a tenant association office that they have some type of security cameras? I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. And the same question, I mean, if, if the management would have said, sorry, we can't allocate this funding from our budget, you should use the uh, appropriate budget for this, I would imagine that's something that the tenant president would have then taken steps to or taken consideration? Again, a person could have done that. That's not what happened here. My, we, I, I'm, I'm also concerned, not for Throg's neck, but the message that we send to these volunteer uh, tenant presidents that take on quite a responsibility with no salary, 
uh, and no benefit. And uh, it's a thankless job. And without them, uh, many of our 177,000 uh, would be less served than they currently are. I, I want to I want to reiterate that because they play an important role on checks and balances, and I could just see after this a management pushing back on the TA president's request for any repair or any maintenance uh, with you know that's borderline harassment and we just went through a whole investigation. I don't want to write you up, so you better behave type of retaliation. What I can say is we have not seen that. I, I share your view generally of the Tennis Association officers. We have worked cooperatively with the officers of many tennis associations. We welcome their involvement. We hope they will call us. We have a 800 number. We have ways to contact us by email. You can walk in the door. If you want to be anonymous, you can be anonymous, and we will follow up even if it's anonymous. We welcome their involvement. I hope they will call us. I hope the message received from our broader investigation is that we will follow up and take action, um, and that the current NYCHA management is a partner with us in that. I, I, I have to respectfully say that I do not I, I have no idea if Ms. Johnson is an effective leader or not. I, the, my own view and the view of DOI is that even passionate, effective leadership does not excuse misconduct, and that's what we found here. I, I'm referring to the bigger picture of the 325 developments in each one. Council Member, if you could just present. include your yeah, question. And I just want to conclude, again, concerned at unintended consequences here and um, perhaps retaliation to other tenant presidents not to fight on behalf of their tenants or be too passionate is something that I'm concerned of and uh, hopefully we can help deliver that message. But it's evident that this culture exists uh, but just based on a sheer number of complaints and I would like to continue working on funding this department outside of NYCHA to make sure that every dollar and every penny goes to the benefit of the tenants, and if we can alleviate uh, some of the additional burdens, I think would be a smart thing on our behalf and make sure that your office is properly funded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilmember Salomon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Um, I, I just I have one question regarding the tenant participa participation funds, and then I want to go uh, to the nitro equipment that was uh, thrown out and discarded. Um, the tenant participation funds here in your, I have a letter that was sent to the chair, the interim chair in February of 2019. Yes, and it says that the Throsneck uh, Resident Association, they've accumulated $103,676 as part of the TPF funds. Um, are they allowed to purchase? What are they allowed to purchase with those funds? Because I know that those those rules are unclear, even from my NYCHA president in, in my district. Um, I, I'll confess, Councilman, I, 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 I don't know. I'm not an expert in that. We do have folks um, in the IG's office who do have some expertise in that. Um, I'm sure, as with many other parts of NYCHA and HUD rules, that the rules probably are complicated. Um, I just don't know sitting here today exactly where the line is in terms of what they can be spent and what's the process for doing that. It's, can I interject very quickly? It's an option. Um, whenever there's an agency, if you have a staffer who's able to answer a question who's present, we do allow them to, obviously under oath, to answer the question. So that's an option okay. you have. So. All right. I, I'm just I'm just curious if uh, the HUD rules allow tenant association presidents to utilize that funding for uh, for in this case a stove, as was recommended here in the um, in your report. Um, I, I'm sorry, in your letter to the interim president. Um, so in your um, in this letter dated January 2019. Um, number six, Paulson and Vereen threw away valuable nitro equipment and circumvented nitro procurement rules. Um, so I see here that they threw away leaf blowers, weed whackers, snow blowers, lawnmowers, drills, saws, brand new pallets of sand. And um, is there a policy uh, that you're aware of uh, for discarding equipment? 
and, and the reason is, you know, prior to me being um, a council member, I was the district manager for a community board. And when we ordered new chairs, I was not allowed to discard them. I needed to call DCAS, and DCAS would come and pick them up, and they would auction them or something. Um, it, does th those rules apply also to NYCHA? Well, NYCHA has their own rules about equipment, and um, I think it's clear here that the discarding of that equipment was completely in violation of those rules, as we sat out in our report. And, I mean, thankfully, a number of the longtime employees, it, as we noted in our report, essentially secretly pulled that equipment out of the trash and secreted it in various locations around the property so that it would not be um, discarded. Is there a dollar amount of equipment that was tossed out? I mean, because you know, weed whackers and you know, leaf blowers, they can be expensive. So we weren't able to, because we were relying for um, this aspect on a number, a number of different witnesses who all corroborated each other, but no one was able to provide a detailed inventory of exactly what was discarded and exactly what was able to be salvaged um, by these employees who were acting appropriately. So I, I don't know exactly what the dollar amount was. Are they, are NYCHA developments, are they mandated to keep an inventory of this type of equipment? Yes. And and, and this inventory, I, I mean, I obviously you didn't have access to the inventory uh, for this report. I, I mean, no, no, I'm just curious if, if, if there's an inventory that's necessary, who would have that inventory? Would NYCHA have that inventory? Or it, it required record keeping of the groundskeeping and superintendent staff is yeah. to keep track of the NYCHA equipment. Here, for a variety of reasons, we were not able to come up with a specific particularized list of exactly what was discarded and what was salvaged. All right. And, and, and my final question is, um, is this practice of, of, of throwing away uh, equipment that they feel is older, they no longer use, they want to, you know, buy new drills uh, and, and, and discarding them in the garbage, is this, a, is this something that you know within your experience or in DOI's experience that happens in other NYCHA developments? No, I mean, I think that I can't say it doesn't happen. It's not supposed to happen. And certainly the conduct here was, as with much of the other conduct, really at the extreme end of what we have seen in other NYCHA developments. Yeah. So there hasn't been any uh, DOI uh, investigations in other NYCHA developments where they found that this is a common practice done? No, sir. No. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Councilman Traeger, and then we'll proceed to the New York City Housing Authorities. Uh, thank you to both chairs for holding this important hearing and welcome commissioner um, so I'm just uh, I just have a few questions I'm uh, just reviewing your testimony uh, and uh, it says here in October of 2017 DOI's office of NYCHA IG received an anonymous call complaining that uh, Brianne Paulson then a supervisor at Throgs Neck was very rude to residents and employees did not wear her NYCHA uniform while at work. We refer the complaint to NYCHA's Bronx Borough Management Director, Ma Management Department for action. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, and did, was there any follow-up from this NYCHA's Bronx Borough Management Department from that complaint? No. No. Uh, in January of 2018, a NYCHA employee emailed the IG to complain that Brian Paulson received favorable treatment as to various administrative matters because her father was a director at NYCHA. We referred that complaint to NYCHA's chief administrative officer for action. Was there any follow-up from that complaint? Um, I don't believe so. Very shortly after that is when Mr. Mustachulo came in and as, as I said later in my testimony, very shortly thereafter, as part of a routine, uh, regularly scheduled meeting between Mr. Masachulo and our Inspector General, the issue of the management complaints at Throgs Neck was raised by Mr. Masachulo in that well, meeting. Well, I'm just, I, I, I guess we have to define what soon after means because this complaint was made in January of 2018 now, I understand uh, GM Mr. Chilo was appointed in February of 2018, but I've just read his testimony, and it appears to me that it was only until the summer of 2018 
did he say that we need to have uh, DOI take over this investigation? Uh, is can can you? Because I, I don't know if you are privy to his, his testimony yet, but we have copies of his testimony already, um, and it's saying that in in by the end of August, without prior notice, senior management went to the development and informed all 40 on-site employees that they were being transferred to other properties and an entirely new team was being brought in. Within hours, we secured the buildings and equipment and we provided notification to incoming staff and ensured that they had the tools needed to succeed. All of this had to be done with the least amount of impact to residents. In an effort to smooth the transition, I also made sure to notify both the leadership of Local 237 and the Resident Association the night before the personal changes went into effect. At this point, both the NYCHA IG and I agreed that this was the proper time to hand off the investigation to DOI. So this is in August of 2018. Yeah, so if I, I, I think, Councilman Trigger, maybe you weren't here for all of my testimony. Right. Where we laid out the history, the, the, the discussion of the problems at Throg's Neck was first discussed between Mr. Mustachulo and Mr. Iannuzzi in the late spring of 2018. And then NYCHA conducted its own internal investigation in that summer. And then DOI's investigation began in the end of August once that mass transfer had taken place. Yeah, and to be clear, I'm not questioning uh, really your offices, uh, what initiated their inquiry. I'm questioning what happened prior to GM Mustachello arriving on the scene. And it appears nothing. I, I think that we, we're aware of no action taken after the August, October 2017 referral. And after the January 2018 referral, it appears that nothing was done. And the reason I raise, there's a little bit of a gap there because Mr. Mustachulo came on the job shortly thereafter, shortly after that complaint was referred. So it, it's, it appears that nothing was done. It's not clear whether that was part of what he was referring to in when in this spring meeting he raised with Mr. Iannuzzi that he was a he he was becoming aware of a number of problems at Throg's Neck and you know how what was the right way to handle it. So in addition to the employees in question, the staff in question that are listed in your findings in your testimony, is anyone else at NYCHA, the the folks that were in receipt of these complaints, uh, are they under scrutiny of any kind, and what was their responsibility to follow up? Um, I think certainly NYCHA management is aware of what referrals were made and to whom, and I think those questions are better directed to NYCHA than us. But did your office found no <laughs> evidence of wrongdoing on, the, on that end? And it, because look, clearly the employees in question, there's, there's a lot of bad things I'm re reading about here in this report, but I am not clear on what accountability there is being placed upon the management or the people that were in receipt of these complaints were supposed to do something about it. And I'm hearing from you that before Vito Mustachello, nothing was being done. So my question is, where is the accountability for that? So again, I think that question is better directed to NYCHA. I think that being a bad manager is not the same as public corruption until there's a point at which it is. but. I think that bad management is a matter for the agency to address, and whether that is, is termination or transfer or demotion, I think there's a variety of, of options available. So, I mean, I, I, forgive me, I am not an attorney, but I, re I remember being a teacher, there were certain things that we were mandated to report to the DOE if we witnessed something or heard about something. Yes. NYCHA management are not, is not mandated to report uh, issues such as corruption or wrongdoing? Well, NYCHA is included within the mandated reporting to DOI of corruption, abuse, mismanagement, and so on. And the, the issue here is what, when we refer complaints to them that were essentially employee misconduct or management complaints, what did they do? And all I can tell you is that in res response to the October 2017 referral and the January 2018 referral, as far as we are aware, no action was taken. So I'll conclude, Mr. Chair, uh, both, both chairs, that it appears that if Vito Mustachello was not appointed, and if he didn't just by chance pass by Throg's Neck, I'm not sure what would have happened here. That's what I'm, that's the sense I'm getting here. 
uh, and Vito was not appointed because of Throgsneck. He was appointed for other reasons. And by the way, I, I'm a fan of his and as far as his follow-up, at least with my office. He, any heating complaints, he will text me back at 11 o'clock at night, which I appreciate. But it appears that if he didn't just happen to stop by Throgsneck and hear some concerns and follow up with you know, your office, nothing would have happened. And so it really rattles the confidence that we have in NYCHA to follow up on complaints and take these matters very serious. And these are the stories that we hear, Commissioner, from residents mm -hmm. almost every day. And it's being validated with this very powerful and sobering testimony. Thank you to both chairs. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to echo what I said earlier, Commissioner. You know, it seems to me when DOI receives multiple tips over a sustained period of time about what adds up to a culture of abuse at an agency, and especially when there are allegations of overtime abuse, right? Even if there's a NYCHA investigation, DOI has primary jurisdiction over the mismanagement of public funds. And, and so I, I just respectfully think that DOI should have been more proactive in investigating the matter before it became a public scandal. I don't know if you have any concluding thoughts. Okay. No. Thank you. We'll call the New York City Housing Authority. Thank you. The general manager, Vito Mastuchulo, uh, Brian Honan, uh, the, and Kerry Jew. Yes. Why? Well, I'll leave you to. And Kathy Pennington, who's the Executive Vice President for Operations. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. I'll need to swear you both in. Sorry. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. We've been joined by uh, Council Member Carlos Menchaca. I apologize, Mr. General Manager. Uh, Chair Torres, Chair Amprey Samuel, members of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations and Public Housing, and other members of the City Council. Is this still good morning? Yes. Uh, good morning. With short time. I am Vito Mostachulo, NYCHA's General Manager. I am pleased to be joined by Kathy Pennington, Executive Vice President of Operations, and Brian Honan, Director of Intergovernmental Relations. I would like to th thank the chairs for postponing this hearing until the conclusion of the Department of Investigations investigation. I would also like to thank the Commissioner of DOI and her entire team for providing a detailed and comprehensive report. I appreciate the opportunity to have the facts presented to the committees and the public, especially given the many uns unsubstantiated allegations that were initially reported. On February 26, 2018, Mayor de Blasio appointed me General Manager of the New York City Housing Authority. Each day I have a renewed appreciation for the responsibility he entrusted with me. On a daily basis, I strive to improve the agency and provide a better living condition and environment for all of our residents. <clears throat> it is unfortunate that the events such as those that occurred at Throg's Neck both distract us from the work that needs to be accomplished and portray widespread mismanagement and abuse. I can tell you that is not the case. Except for a few bad actors, NYCHA employees are overwhelmingly some of the most dedicated, proud, and hardworking employees I have met in my long tenure in public service. We can and must do better to weed out those bad actors and restore our residents and the public's confidence in us. This body has in the past focused on improvements 
such as empl employee performance evaluations. We are open to these ideas and will continue to work with our partners in labor to make these happen. In my first few months, I made a point of visiting as many developments as I could throughout the five boroughs. One of the first developments that I toured was Throg's Neck Houses in the Bronx. I still have a vivid recollection of my reaction to what I observed within just minutes of stepping foot in the development. There was a pond of raw sewage that had accumulated in front of one of the high-rise buildings with sump pumps running 24-7 to prevent overflow. I saw pigeon nests inside the stairwells of one of the low-rise buildings. My decades of experience in, in enforcing the New York City Housing Maintenance Code at HPD made me realize immediately that this was a troubled property. I had to ask myself, where was management and staff charged with maintaining these buildings? <laughs> the conditions were totally unacceptable and I needed immediate answers and solutions. At the conclusion of the tour, I went straight to the property management office and instructed both the, the then borough director and regional asset manager to provide daily progress reports with details on how they would correct the sewage stoppage and other unacceptable conditions. At the same time, we began looking at overtime reports, maintenance logs, work order history, and service level standards. In early May 2018, during another visit to Throg's Neck, Resident Association President Monique Johnson brought to my attention allegations of misconduct, including abuses of overtime, parties during work hours, including several staff members. It was at that time that I had NYCHA's Office of Safety and Security begin an investigation, which included unannounced visits, interviews, and surveillance of staff. During the investigation, I provided regular verbal status reports to NYCHA's Inspector General. By mid-July, we were not able to verify the allegations, but had enough information about the operations at Throg's Neck to have serious concerns. These concerns mirrored the issues identified by DOI in its report. Abuse of overtime, lax oversight of supplies, lack of procurement planning that led to overuse of micro-purchasing, and general mismanagement. It was clear that we had to execute a complete top-to-bottom overhaul of the development staff. By the end of August, without prior notice, senior management went to the development and informed all 40-plus on-site employees that they were being transferred to other properties and an entirely new team was being brought in. Within hours, we secured the building, the building's equipment, and we provided notification to incoming staff and ensured them that the tools that they needed would be there for them to succeed. All of this had to be done with the least amount of impact to the residents. In an effort to smooth the transition, I also made sure to notify both the leadership of Local 237 and the resident association leader the night before the personnel changes happened. At this point, both NYCHA, the NYCHA Inspector General and I agreed that this was the proper time to hand the investigation off to DOI. The events I just described demonstrate how seriously we take allegations of inappropriate behavior by staff and mismanagement of our developments. We have zero tolerance for misconduct, shirking of duties, and any disregard for the safety and well-being of the residents that we are charged to serve. Disciplinary actions have been taken against three staff members formally assigned to Throg's Neck. Two of those actions have led to additional charges and the proceedings are still underway. I am unfortunately not at liberty to discuss the status of these cases until the hearings have concluded. In the last year, we have made several significant changes to how the agency operates. Each experience, such as what we dealt with at Throg's Neck, serves as a learning tool. We are committed to making additional changes where and when necessary to improve our ability to become a more responsible landlord. While the use of overtime is often necessary to fulfill our duties, it cannot and should not be abused. To prevent such abuse, we've implemented interim controls over the approval process, which require a vice president or senior management to approve all overtime for anything other than immediate emergencies. We recently reached an agreement with the Teamsters on a new work schedule for caretakers and will begin rolling out the new schedule at 13 consolidation developments by the beginning of April. Caretakers will now work seven days a week from 6 a.m. until 7 p.m. on a regular schedule as opposed to Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4.30. We accomplished this new work schedule and added 210 new caretakers within our existing regular and overtime budgets. And we are not finished. Negotiations are now underway to create a similar work schedule for our maintenance staff. 
This is particularly important as we know that choosing between work and staying home to get repairs done can be a financial hardship for our residents. I want to thank Greg Floyd and Local 237 for their continued collaboration on these very important changes. Both NYCHA and Local 237 are aligned in the goal of not only delivering a higher level of service to residents, but also creating a better work environment for our staff. <clears throat> Over the last few years, there have been a number of reports issued in oversight hearings held by this body that identify deficiencies in NYCHA's inventory and supply management controls. Despite NYCHA making significant progress in addressing these deficiencies, we realize we have more work to do. Moving forward, we will have a better system for tracking materials. We are transitioning the management and oversight of development storerooms to the materials management department. The new staffing model will commit employees exclusively to the management of materials, assigning full-time staff person to each storeroom, and only that employee will have access to the storeroom. We are also implementing new procedures and policies along with new inventory technology, such as automated inventory updates and tracking of materials by serial numbers. These efforts will enable management staff to better focus on building maintenance while strengthening inventory controls and improving the availability of materials needed to serve our residents. Again, these changes are being driven by the desire to improve accountability and independent controls and the belief that property managers need, need to get back to the basics and not be concerned as to how to get the supplies and materials that they need. Our procurement and IT departments have made enhancements to our data systems to provide fair and proper processes for purchasing goods and services. These changes will help address any concerns about abuses of the micro-purchasing process and improve our ability to detect any effort to split bid, which is a way of breaking up larger contracts. <clears throat> we are strengthening and tightening our controls including automated alerts for our procurement and audit departments and senior level staff as a means of early detection when policies are being violated. Through better planning, our objective is to substantially reduce the need for micro-purchases with greater use of requirement contracts. These contracts eliminate the need for individual job scoping and bidding and generally provide for better pricing based on volume. We have already started to get these contracts in place. Today, NYCHA has a staff review process, unlike most other city agencies, which is a form of performance-based evaluation. We have service-level standards, instructional and counseling letters, and a robust dis disciplinary process. This process includes monthly meetings of executive-level staff and the NYCHA Inspector General that review and decide on certain disciplinary cases. NYCHA is committed to providing a high level of service to residents at the same time providing staff with the tools necessary to do their jobs. There's always room for improvement and absolutely no room for those who are not, who are not about change or do not want to be part of our team. The last year has been challenging, but we are slowly changing the culture and I am confident that we have a team in place that is up for the challenge. We have, a re renewed, and we have renewed and built stronger relationships with our partners who share our goals and desire to improve NYCHA and the lives of our residents. I thank you all for the support that you've been giving us and this important work that we do and for offering your advice as to how we can better transform NYCHA. Like you, I listen to our residents and I hear their voices. I look forward to our continued partnership as we move forward. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. General Manager. Um, I want to note that you have the most demanding position in city government. Thank you. And I have the highest respect for you. You're a public servant of immense integrity. Um, as you know, I've, I've been, I've had concerns about NYCHA's longstanding, what I would perceive as NYCHA's longstanding culture of dysfunction and deception. And I do have concerns about the lack of transparency surrounding the initial handling of the scandal in Throg's Neck. When, when NYCHA was asked about the reasons for the reassignment, a NYCHA spokesperson said the following in a daily news article by Greg Smith dating back to August 27, 2018. Quote, as part of a top-to-bottom assessment NYCHA's new leadership is conducting across the authority, we are reorganizing staff to better serve the needs of our residents. We have since come to discover that the reassignment was not the result of a top-to-bottom assessment across the housing authority, as your spokesperson originally claimed. The re reassignment <coughs> was a highly specific response to a specific management scandal 
at the Roxnack houses. And so instead of telling the truth and leveling with the public, NYCHA chose to mislead the public, us, the city council, about the actual reasons for the reassignment. Like, why not just, why did NYCHA not choose to tell the truth from the very beginning? So just to be clear, um, the decision not to disclose the, the reason um, why the transfer occurred was mine. Right? So that statement was issued by our um, communications office, but that was my, my statement. Um, we had conducted a, a thorough investigation into the allegations that were raised. Right? And it didn't take us long to realize that, that we didn't have enough evidence to proceed um, with respect to the, those allegations, but there were other findings findings that potentially could have led, led to um, criminal charges. Right? Um, I am not, um, I am I'm held uh, to a standard uh, that, that if I believe that there is corruption or if there is mismanagement and there is um, a, a handoff to the Department of Investigations, that I can't publicly disclose that. Right? So I followed the executive. But, but with respect, General Manager, you could have said there were allegations of mismanagement and misconduct specific to Throgsnack Houses without disclosing the details, I but to claim that it was part of a broader reorganization of the Housing Authority, with respect, it's misleading. And the reason I'm dwelling on this point is, you know, DOI has found that NYCH has made false statements to both the public and the City Council about fire safety, about lead safety, about a whole host of issues. And so the, I think the agency has to make an effort within the constraints of confidentiality to be as transparent and truthful as possible. But, but I won't dwell on this. I don't know if you have any further, further comment. Well, I, again, I just want to reiterate. Um, and I, again, I, I do believe that we have been more transparent um, and that there is more work to be done. Um, again, my concern was that if, if we um, provided too much information um, to the public, that it potentially would um, impede DOI's ability to conduct an investigation that potentially could have led to criminal charges. Now, you, you indicated in your opening statement that, because the question is, were there early signs uh, that the Roxnack Houses was caught in a downward spiral, that there was a genuine management crisis at the Roxnack? So I want to, you acknowledged in your opening statement that you perceived the Roxnack as a troubled development. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, Throgsnack Houses is a consolidation of three housing developments, Throgsnack Proper, Throgsnack Addition, and Randall Balcom, which is a senior-only development. It, it's a massive development. It has over 1,700 apartments, over 3,700 residents, about 38 buildings, and over 2 million square feet. Why would NYCHA allow a development the size of Throgsnack to go months without a property manager? And again, I don't want to speak um, because that happened prior yeah. to my coming on board. Um, I, I think you pointed out earlier in your opening statement that NYCHA has unfortunately um, had, has not received proper funding. Um, so if we just take the Rocksnick, for example, um, if you look at the, um, the physical needs assessment that we put out, um, Throgsnack requires about $350 million in capital monies. There are also restrictions um, with respect to staffing, right? and and we need additional funding um, for staffing as well. How long did NYCHA go without a property manager? I believe it was... Uh, the Rocksnack Houses one. I, I think it was, yeah. Eight, eight less, months. Yeah, less than, less than a year. But... Um, but and, NYCHA, and just in fairness, NYCHA didn't, and the Rocksnack Houses did not receive a property manager until after the scandal broke, and then it made the headlines in the Daily News and the New York Times and the New York Post. There was a manager appointed in the, in the summer, of l last summer, yes. Yeah. Right. But um, just to speak to the prolonged um, vacancy, yeah, it, 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 I'm sorry, it is much longer than, than um, we would have preferred. Unfortunately, we had, uh, that manager was out on a uh, medical issue and we had anticipated a sooner return. Um, I should tell you, though, that when there is a vacancy, the um, superintendent steps into the role with support from the borough offices when we're in an interim uh, situation. So it wasn't that there was 
no management overseeing, yeah. but it certainly was. But that long. arrangement might work for a small development, yeah. like yeah. Twin Parks West. Yes, of course. But when you have a development of 38 buildings and 2 right. million square feet, yeah. uh, you need both a property maintenance supervisor and a property manager. How long on average does it take you to fill a vacancy for a property manager? Well, I'm sorry, just before yeah. um, Kathy answers that question, I just want to point out what Kathy noted, which is that the property manager had not left service. The property manager was out on leave. Right. So we can't replace a property manager. We can't hire a new property manager. N not even on a provisional basis or a temporary basis? Or? Well, we can do float. It. We call them floaters, people to fill But, but right after the scandal broke, you were able to hire a manager, so. Well, no, the property manager left city service at that point. It coincided with the? I'm not sure of the exact timing. We can certainly get back to you. Um, I also. Yeah. In response to the length of time to fill a vacancy, it, it sometimes varies if we're going through is, a Is there an average? I'll have to defer to our HR department to is, respond to Is it to fair to average. say that eight months is probably higher than the average amount of time? Yes, yes. M substantially higher. Right. Okay. So uh, to, the, to the question, so the posting for the position was um, put up immediately after the leave expired. When did the leave expire? You have to, you have so, to so if you could just tell me the month and, and if you can yeah. identify yourself. Sure. Um, come, on, come on, come on. And if you could just quickly swear yes. the witness in. My name is... Oh. Yeah. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And if you could identify yourself. Um, my name is Nicole Van Gen. I'm the NYCHA Director of Human Resources. Um, when we receive a request for medical leave, we have an obligation under the FMLA to return the person to a position as close as possible to the position they vacated. Um, there's guidance indicating that this includes the location. Um, so the, the when did the leave expire? Oh, um, she went out on 11-27, so it would have expired three months after that. Give or take eleven twenty uh, eleven twenty seven seventeen. Okay. It would have expired in February. At the end of February of two thousand seventeen. Eighteen. 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 Thank you. Okay. The, I'm sorry. The end of February right. two thousand eighteen. So, Drugsnet went even even with the expiration of the leave. Drugsnet went multiple months without a property manager. And NYCHA certainly had the ability to hire a property manager after February after the expiration of the leave and did not until the scandal made headlines. That, that's a concern. I just want to set a scene of what it was like to live in the Roxnet houses, right? You, so again, you, after you, my initial visit, um, when I discovered the, the sewage issues and the lack of yeah. uh, proper maintenance, I did instruct the regional asset manager um, and the borough director that they had to basically step in and, and fill the shoes of the property manager. Right. Now, it's also important, to, we've been looking at a number of different models um, and how we should, um, restructure. It, it, it's clear to me that when we do have um, a vacancy, even if it's temporary, um, that we need to have a pool of staff that we can go to, as Kathy indicated, floaters. Um, that will require us bringing on additional staff um, at these levels, um, but it's become abundantly clear to me in the last year that that's a worthwhile investment. Okay. Um, how, many, how many developments do you have in your portfolio? All of them. No, how many developments? What's the number? So it's currently 318 developments. And out of 318 developments, which development had the highest overtime expenditure in last year? Uh, Throgsnack. It was Throgsnack. Okay. Yes. What was the um, there's scheduled overtime and unscheduled overtime? Yes. What was the unscheduled overtime for Throgsnack in 2017? I have 2018. I'll have to look for 2017. Uh, but for unscheduled for uh, 2018, it was 503,000. 503,000, right? Yes. And do you know what it was in 2017? Um, I'll have to look for that information. Okay. I know what it is. Okay. So it was 290,000. So from 2017 to 2018, it was a 40% increase in overtime at the Roxnack Houses. Not to mention the fact that Throxnack had the highest overtime out of 318 developments 
in NYCHA's portfolio. Again, I want to paint a picture of a development that was deeply troubled, and NYCHA knew that it was deeply troubled. Let's go to work orders, response time. What's, what was the response time to repairs in 2017 at the Rock Snack Houses? So I don't have the service levels from 2017 with me. Um, I can tell you what they currently are. Are you talking about for maintenance? What about 2018? Do you have the data for 2018? For 2018, they currently have open 3,132. So the number of days, the response work, time. Work orders. So for maintenance, it takes an average right now of 15 days to complete service. What did it take in 2018? I don't have that in front of me. I'm sorry. Okay. Can we get that data? I'm sorry. Yes. Which year did you ask for? 2018. 18. The year of this. Okay. When NYCHA had no property manager and the scandal was unfolding. If you can get me, we want to compare 2017 to 2018. Okay. Um, so, again, I just want to recap. From the moment you entered Throg's Neck, you realized it was a troubled development. Correct. Throg's Neck went eight months without a property manager. DOI and NYCHA had received various tips about a culture of abuse, including possible overtime abuse at Throg's Neck houses. The Roxnack had the highest overtime expenditures in the city. The Roxnack saw a 40% increase in unscheduled overtime from 2017 to 2018. There were signs, clear signs, yes. like NYCHA knew or should have known that there was something wrong at the Roxnack houses. I want to specifically comment on procurement misconduct. Um, as you know, there's a phenomenon known as Bid splitting. I'll just wait. Just getting prepared. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you could swear, the witness. We'll swear you with now. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Okay. Now there's a the DOI report claims that there was a practice known as bid splitting uh, transpiring at the Rock Snack Houses, right? So there are contracts below the $5,000 threshold mm -hmm. that require no bidding, mm -hmm. that have the least amount of oversight, right? There are tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars spent on what are known as micro Purchases. procurements. Right. And since there's no bidding and since there's minimal review, a manager or a superintendent could carefully structure these bids to <coughs> evade bidding requirements in the hopes of steering these bids toward preferred vendors, toward fen friends. So it, it's the mismanagement of, of public funds. It's a serious problem. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, bid splitting can arise in the following circumstances. Either a NYCHA official solicits quotes for the same service on the same day or over a short period of time. Is that... Right. For us right now, it's if you're soliciting service within the same day. So bid splitting is a little tough to kind of identify. It's if you know the full need up front, and yet you are splitting the, the request. But, but you can engage in bid splitting over different days, but within a short period of time. Right. I could take, a, let's say, a $49,000, what should be a $49,000 paint uh, mm -hmm. contract for painting, and divide it into 10 contracts for $4,900 over a two-week period. I would consider that bid splitting. Right. If you knew the full need up front, then yes. Okay. NYCHA system, can it flag, it can flag cases when an official solicits quotes for the same service on the same day? Not at the moment. We're building system alerts now to kind of include the quote dates so that if a development is submitting a service, a quote with the same dates, but staggering the submission to procurement, then it would be flagged in our system. So you cannot, so even if, if I'm a property manager mm -hmm. and I'm soliciting quotes for the same service on the same day, you cannot flag those cases? At the moment, no. It would be up to the procurement staff to kind of remember that there was a request that came in okay. in a relative. So you cannot time. track abuses, mismanagement of contracts at the local level, is that? So again, as you dare indicated, um, currently no. Um, but again, the investigation. And that's um, troubling. Well, and tens, that's of if not hundreds of millions of dollars which that is could be mismanaged we, at the local level. Which is why we have moved to uh, change the process. Um, as I indicated in my testimony, 
And, we've and what exactly is the gap in the process? What's the gap in your system that prevents you from tracking abuses and irregularities in procurement? Well, if I, if I may, yeah. just go back to, again, the statement in my testimony um, where we are, um, we've identified the most common um, uses of the micro-purchase on the service um, side, and we have already put in place a number of, per, of requirement contracts and are working um, to add additional requirement contracts, which will eliminate the, um, the need to use micro-purchases. That would reduce the usage on the micro-purchase um, for services about 40 percent, right, which is significant. And that's just the first step. Right? In addition to which, we are building in additional um, bells and alarms and whistles um, in the current process that will identify these types of abuses. Right? So it's not just left up to... A well, what's, what's the gap that you're filling? Like, what is the gap in your current system that prevents you from tracking abuses of mismanagement of funds at the local level, abuses of procurement? So I think, um, as and I'll spin back to Yadera and Nurka Kathy, um, but part of it really has to do with when the condition was identified and when the need was identified. Right? And that's difficult to determine at times. Right? So, for instance, if it, if let me maybe actually ask a more specific sure. question: What are you, what are you not tracking that you should be tracking in order to expose or discover or detect abuses in procurement? That's it. So right now our systems don't have the quote dates, right? So that we can't do any kind of reporting and analytical work on that end. Uh, we do have the quote date and we attach it to, um, to the purchase order, but it's tough to do a kind of retrospect analysis on Do you, on do you the track process. the vendor? Yes, we know which vendor. Do you track the nature of the service? Yes, we track the nature but of the service. But without tracking the quote date, you have no means of identifying bid splitting. Right. So you're going to upgrade your system to include the quote date? That is correct. So what's the timeline? Um, well, we're actively working with our procure with our IT department, so I would say maybe 30 to 60 days, if not less. 30 to 60 days? If not less, yes. I want to ask a few questions about inventory, and then I'll hand it off to the public housing chair. I will have more questions throughout the course of the hearing. So we know that NYCHA has no, yes. oh yeah, please. Sorry. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Okay, so we know there's no tracking system or sufficient tracking system for micro procurements. What about, is there a system in place for tracking equipment, assets, supplies? Kathy, do you want to start? So, so yes. Um, so we currently track supplies at the development. So the storeroom, there's a storeroom employee who tracks the materials as they are distributed uh, to the storeroom. So upon delivery, the staff uh, check in the, the inventory as it is delivered. And then as uh, they, they, when they um, distribute materials um, given to the staff, they also use what's called a stock with Draw slip. Some of this is uh, paperwork and forms and procedures that are just for store storeroom management. Uh, if uh, skilled trades or other uh, employees, such as carpenters, come and have uh, are pulling inventory out, they also submit stock withdrawals. We have sometimes more than one supply room. We have a master storeroom by development, but then some trades who have very large pieces of uh, materials like drywall, we store those in another storeroom, but just, we still I, have the same process for withdrawal. Wanna, yes. So each storeroom has an employee. Yes. Um, how does the employee document the supplies, the equipment? Is it done digitally? Is it done in? It's done both. Uh, there are some uh, systems that we use for a limited number of our inventory that we check into a system that keeps track of the amount of inventory we have. And what's that limited amount of inventory? I believe it is 77 items that we, categories of items that we are currently um, track in our systems. So you're, you're the storeroom employee 
is expected to digitally track 77 items of inventory. Is that As they come in and they Categories of inventory. Yes. What about the rest of your inventory? That's done through what I described as the withdrawal process where they use slips, you know. But that's not digitized. Document. That, that piece is not. Not okay. for all the inventory. Is NYCHA, does NYCHA intend to digitize everything or you contend to? So if I can, Kathy yeah. has described the current, current. Uh, inventory system, which, um, you know, and again, there have been a number of findings both by this body as well as by the New York City Comptroller's yeah. Office um, with respect to our inventory control systems. <laughs> and while there have been advances made, um, clearly we, at some point in time, just dropped the ball right, and should have continued, um, which is something that we have picked up. Right? And, and we have put in place, um, and, and again, in my, in my testimony, I mentioned that the storm supervisors, um, as of April, and this will be a rollout over time, but beginning in April, storm room supervisors will no longer report to the property management staff. Um, they will report to uh, Tony, who's here with us now, um, to our materials and management department. Um, and over time, and it will take us a few months to roll this out, um, all storeroom um, staff, supervisors will um, no longer be reporting to operations. Um, so there are independent controls that we will put in place. We're expanding on the inventory. Uh, the, the ultimate goal is to digitize everything uh, or? Tony, do you want? Is that? Yeah. The answer is yeah. So everything in the development uh, maintenance storeroom will be in the Maximo system. That's our inventory. Uh, it's the work ticket as well as inventory system, um, as well as the appliance rooms, which are the stove and refrigerator supply rooms. That we, that will come directly on the materials management, and then as time goes on, we'll increase that to the other uh, areas. Now it sounds like the burden of documenting, either in writing or digitally your inventory falls on the storeroom employee. Does every storeroom have an employee consistently? Well, again, once we take over with them, every, they will be a-, a, a No, but I'm asking now- As of today, no. No. Well, each one has one, it's just that sometimes they're removed to assist in other duties. So- Okay. So, so the one person on whom we depend to digitally document what's coming in, what's going out, can be siphoned off elsewhere in the development. As of today, correct. Right. So there is, so, April, there, so there is no that. consistent record keeping of your inventory at every single development. Well, they still keep they still keep records on the inventory as it's coming in and out, right? I mean, so there is a documented process. I think what we're describing is we have recognized. Right, but if I'm an if I'm if I'm assigned to a storeroom, mm -hmm. and I've been reassigned elsewhere. How, how am I going to know what's going in out on that We're given day? We're talking about on a given day, it, we, we may, because of an absence or an urgent need, may need to divert the person for two hours to go help out on a maintenance situation, right? We're not talking about all day long they're gone or they're consistently gone from the storeroom. They're in the storeroom daily. But there are occasions in which, because we're short-staffed, we may need to pull them for a part of the day. The new process will be yeah. full-time committed storeroom staff. Can I? So you, you you track? Do you track what? I want to understand what you're tracking exactly with respect to these items. You're tracking the purchase of these items. The, the, the purchase seven. Of, the, what, the, what we're talking about today. Right. Or in general, your inventory in general. Do you track the purchase? Yeah, everything is tracked the purchase, right. and then and and you track the location. The seventy-seven items that are presently being tracked are going on to work orders when they're taken out to utilize in to So you track the advance. purchase of these items, you track the, delivery. the location of your items or the transfer of those items. What about, there was mention in the report of the destruction of appliances or the discarding of equipment. Do you track the condition of your supplies, your inventory, your equipment? So there is a, um, a specific procedure that speaks to the disposal of equipment. Um, it's but I'm asking about the tracking of the condition. So, well, you, you track the condition. I'm not sure quite what you mean by track the condition. You Meaning, mean, if I'm a, could I destroy huge quantities of NYCHA supplies and equipment without you finding out? According to our procedures, no. If you follow the procedures, if... So what if I'm not, what if I'm a, a willful actor? I'm a bad actor? Well, then uh, you're, you're a able, bad actor, you... Do you have a system in place to prevent a manager or superintendent from destroying equipment or stealing equipment we without have you knowing? We have procedures in place that guide 
um, all employees at developments on the proper maintenance and disposal of equipment. And do they do look at conditions. No, no, I, I think we're, we're speaking. Okay. You're, you're, you're assuming a scenario in which everyone follows the rules, right? Okay. I'm imagining a world like the Rock Snack Houses mm -hmm. where managers or superintendents were acting in bad faith, were sabotaging equipment and appliances, right? Is it possible, given the limitations of your current inventory system, is it possible to destroy substantial quantities of supplies and equipment without you even knowing? It is possible. It should be picked up when management is doing what we refer to as cycle counts. So their management, meaning not not the storeroom staff or not the What if the management is the bad actor? Well, that that poses a problem. Yes. So in those cases, you're not able to track it. Well, and, and clearly, the, the new um, the new reporting structure. Um, we will hopefully eliminate the ability for someone to do that, right, for an indiv individual um, to, to intentionally damage and destroy property. Right, um, it would raise a flag right, in the system if every appliance that was delivered to one development all had the same damage. Right, so, yes, the new system will catch that. It, okay. Because there'll be more independence from the and, development. And, and when do you intend to implement the new system? So we're starting April. Starting April, we're going to roll out, and it's going to be a rollout uh, development. Center. And every storeroom and employee will report to your division. That is correct. Rather than the local development. That is correct. correct. And, and only they will have access and, to the storeroom. And there will be no reassignment of those employees elsewhere. He means to do. Oh no! Work. No, absolutely not. No. Right. Right. You'll have one storeroom employee who's will be dedicated, dedicated to, to the storeroom, the storeroom, and never diverted elsewhere. Right. That is correct. Right. Okay. And materials and management does not report up to operations; it reports to procurement. Okay. And we will additionally we'll have floaters so that if uh, to cover for absences, so that at every moment there will be someone in the storeroom. And additional supervisors. Yeah. I we wanna, really feel this new structure provides integrity because there's more independence, right, and better controls with the system part. So we're very much looking forward to improved accountability in this area. So I have more questions, but I do want to give my co-chair the floor. My questions are related to your disciplinary process and um, the evaluations so we can speak to the resolution that um, Councilmember Salamanca, Resolution 676 that he introduced. So first, can you describe um, your systems and processes for disciplining employees and managers for misconduct? And with that, what employees are union members? And it would be helpful to know um, the, within the report, uh, which unions were represented first. Okay. So do you want to start with that? Sure. With respect to our current performance management evaluation system, we have three categories of employees that are subject to regular evaluation. Those are managerial employees and those that are not represented by a union. Um, those that are new to the authority are evaluated on a quarterly basis. And those who have been promoted into a new civil se service title are promoted on a quarterly basis, or are evaluated on a quarterly basis. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? So with that, so after that, I'm asking, um, can you ex just describe what the actual process is for disciplining um, based on misconduct, those different categories that you mentioned? And then uh, for those that are represented by a union, can you um, list the unions um, that are involved? And then that will go into uh, what is the collective bargaining discussion between those employees and, and NYCHA and the unions. Sure. So in addition to the performance management tool, we have a number of other disciplinary tools available to us. We have instructional memos. We have counseling memos. We have local hearings. And we have general hearings. OK. So can you break that down for each category? You just named three categories. So sure. let's start with the first one with the management. And then we'll go into the second and then the third. And can you give us some detail as to what the actual process is? So if, a, if an employee um, um, files an allegation or a complaint against their manager, what is it that NYCHA will do? And can you provide us with some steps? Sure. It depends on the nature of the complaint. 
Um, there are four primary points of contact to receive complaints. Um, the IG's office, DEO, the Office of Safety and Security, and HR. Um, all four of those entities cross-report to an, each other. So if, if an employee does not, in the first instance, file with the appropriate department, it'll be referred over to the other department. And then you notify the manager, or, and the manager comes into the office, and you say to the manager, you have, there's been a, a complaint filed against you by this particular employee, this is what was alleged, and then, like, that's done within 24 hours, and then the manager will say, you know, well, this is my side of the store. Like, can you, pr sure, can I you can paint a picture <laughs> for us, please, because this is not working right now. Okay. Um, so with respect to HR complaints, we usually reach out to the complainant first. We will then reach out to anyone identified in the complainant's allegation um, to ask them questions about the subject matter of their allegation. Um, with respect to the other departments, I believe the process is to notify the complainant, the respondent, and the department, um, but I don't want to speak to procedures outside of my department. Right. So, for instance, a, a complaint that might be lodged with the Department of Equal Opportunity um, is confidential. I'm just talking about within NYCHA, NYCHA systems, no, NYCHA no, process. No, but these are all within NYCHA. Okay. So employees have basically different venues depending on the type of complaint. Right. So they can either go to DEO if it was a complaint about sexual harassment, sexual harassment um, if it's about um, discrimination. Uh, discrimination. <laughs> Um, they can go to the office of the, uh, also office of the inspector general um, if it's about uh, corruption allegations. Um, so it takes a different form, and and the the way that the investigations or the re complaints are responded to um, are different depending on the type of complaint. Okay, so so, it, it so just in context of this right here, not, so we just, so let's just talk about Throgsnick since we're in a Throgsnick hearing and we were talking about sexual allegation and partying and everything else. I'm just trying to get an understanding of just what the, what the steps will be like moving forward. So for allegations such as that, the staff should have gone to the Department of Equal, um, Equal Opportunity. And those investigations are confidential. Right? Um, in fact, they don't even share um, that information with, with, my, with my office uh, until the conclusion of the investigation uh, and there are findings. Um, at that point, you honestly don't know who's involved and who's not, um, which is why they conduct confidential investigations. So the reason why I mention this is because, you know, in your testimony, it says this body has in the past focused on improvements such as employee performance evaluations. We are open to these ideas and will work with our partners in labor to make that happen. And so, again, you know, in my opening remarks, I said that we have been complaining about um, mismanagement and um, uh, Councilmember Salamanca mentioned last year um, he asked a question about performance evaluations and then um, Carrie Jew said that you know we don't talk about um, evaluate that's difficult it's, it could be a union issue and so we are it's, it's, it's been almost a year and because and so Throgsnack was like the straw that broke the camel's back right and so at this point we should be beyond we are open to these ideas and we'll work with our partners in labor to make them happen. So I'm asking what type of conversations, what have, what, what's um, been um, implemented or in the works or a rollout um, that speak directly to disciplining uh, employees um, based on misconduct and what unions have you been working with, and can you list sure. those unions? Sure. So Maybe I am not articulating myself. No, no, um, and, and perhaps we um, misunderstood because we were talking about just really, um, well, also, uh, where can employees go um, if they have complaints? And depending on the nature of complaint, um, Nicole kind of outlined the different areas where, where they can go. Um, to your direct question, um, with respect to performance evaluations, so we have already implemented um, a process for us to um, conduct performance evaluations for our managerial staff, um, which is currently in place. Um, and, and honestly, I believe that we should start at the top and work our way uh, down to lower level staff. Um, it would be unfair for us to require performance evaluations for, uh, for caretakers if management's not being evaluated. Um, so that's already underway. I, mean, I think what we've discussed in the past is um, that you are able to do the um, evaluations for the managerial staff because they're not union? They're not covered under collective bargaining. Right. Correct. 
Right, so under collective bargaining, we have the ability to and the right to um, to perform performance evaluations. What is covered under collective bargaining and where we have already started conversations with at least 237, which represents a vast majority of our staff, um, really has to do with process and, and policy. Right, how will we use the performance evaluations? How will they be, um, be constructed? Right, so we do have the a right under collective bargaining um, to perform them. Um, but we, what we are still working through are the... So what are the obstacles that you're coming up against? I wouldn't say that there are obstacles. This is a, a time-consuming process. This agency has not used performance evaluations like this. I don't know if they have... Not on this scale. Right. So it's, it's, it's really starting new. It's starting fresh. Um, we've had some really... Um, some constructive conversations with the with 237. We have not reached out to other unions at this point. Again, knowing that 237 represents um, a majority of the staff that will be impacted by this. Um, but again, as what was indicated before, I don't want you know to be left with the um, impression that we have no way of evaluating performance. Mm -hmm. All right, so again, when an employee starts with the agency, there are quarterly um, performance evaluations in the first year. If you change a title or position, I, um, that process starts all over again. So what does that look like, the quarterly evaluations when an employee first begins? Sure, I'm gonna just, yeah, go ahead. No, I just wanna come back to other mm -hmm. ways that we evaluate staff. Mm -hmm. Sure, there are five basic competencies. Uh, it's a one-page evaluation that's filled out in writing by the supervisor. Um, the competencies, I, I don't remember entirely off the top of my head, but it has to do with time and attendance, it has to do with timely performance of tasks, it has to do with cooperation and collegiality. Um, and there are, there are two other categories that I, I can't think of right now. So again, and I come from an agency where performance evaluations were used as perhaps the only tool, one of the only tools um, to evaluate the performance of an employee. Um, what I have found at the Housing Authority is the use of um, the instructional memos or letters and, and the counseling letters um, to me serve as um, more of an indicator of, of an employee's performance. Um, because it really addresses a real-time occurrence. So as opposed to waiting until the end of the year uh, to actually to do an evaluation of the employee where a supervisor may have changed or you may have forgotten an incident that happened in the past, the way that, that the authority uses the instructional and counseling memos, um, I think is pretty um, noteworthy. Right? Um, again, you're, you're dealing with a real-time occurrence. You're writing up the incident. I, it can mean something as simple as an instructional memo to a staff saying, you did something wrong, this is why it was wrong, and correct it to a counseling memo, which is a little bit more severe. And, and a number of counseling letters can lead to a local hearing. So there is um, a structure that's in place. And I don't think we've adequ adequately explained that in, in past hearings. Um, so again, I don't want um, you to be left with the impression that nothing is happening. And we also have the SLAs. And we honestly need to do much better there. We need to kind of update our service level um, responses and, and what we expect of our staff. Right? And I do believe that there's been a lot of movement in that direction in the last year. Um, are we done? Absolutely not. Right? Um, we're talking about, again, dealing with, with uh, years and years of, of change. Um, and, and we're trying to do it in a very short time. We want to do it the right way. So, um, and, and you mentioned um, like the counseling memos. When I think about performance evaluations, I also think about when you want to have a productive company and if you are looking at how to have the best outcomes for your customers um, and you, you work with your employees, you also ask them, you know, um, how do you evaluate yourself? And, um, you know, where do you see yourself at this given moment as far as your job is concerned? Are you able to perform the duties and, and services that you were hired to do? And, um, and then there's a discussion with your supervisor about that particular um, where you are. And then um, there are certain metrics and, you know, like just performances in order to stay on track with being productive in your job and that's also a way to be able to you know feel good about what you're doing the service that you're provide as an individual right and knowing that and it will make you also feel like I have the support of my supervisor or the tools to be able to do my job and so um, um, is that something that you actually do and track 
and put that into an actual system that is monitored and you know like personal goals and so the way that you describe goals. the evaluation process is exactly how we are rolling out the managerial performance evaluation and right? it's also a re self reflection right? and, and it's an opportunity for you to uh, to look at at your performance and, and to be you know critical and judgmental of yourself um, so I think that it's a, it's a great system. So that's what you're going to roll out. Well, that's what we're doing it's, now for that's managers. What you're doing now. Right? It's currently out now, and and you know we want to um, continue that with the other titles as well. Um, I also want to point out too that what we do, um, which I think is also reflective, we're talking about the negatives, right? but the agency also issues commendation letters, um, and which I think is also important. This is also important to recognize when someone does something good. Right? We've only focused on the negatives. Right? So when we do our we meet twice a month. Um, on a, we have a disciplinary panel, um, which is comprised of, of senior staff um, and the office of the inspector general. And when we're reviewing a disciplinary action um, and determining what additional actions, if any, should be taken, what we look at are the employees' commendation letters. We look at, at the number of counseling letters that they've received, if they've been in front of, um, uh, if they've had a local hearing uh, um, or, or a general. Um, so we do kind of look at the the entirety of, of the employee's performance, and that weighs heavily on, on our decisions. And can you describe that with those who are um, represented by the union? Like we talked about the managerial, but it, can you just... On the performance evaluation itself? Performance evaluation and, yeah, yeah. and what you would like to see. So as Vito indicated, um, we are constrained by the collective bargaining mm -hmm. law um, to, to use the performance evaluation for any type of discipline or any other employment consequence we would have to bargain. Um, we have engaged Local 237 on that. They've been extremely supportive of the process. We had several meetings with them in 2017. Um, and we're scheduled to have, we've sent them a prototype of, um, of the desired competencies we'd like in an evaluation. These include quantity of work, quality of work, cooperation attitude, learning capacity, ability and potential, attendance and lateness. Um, we are waiting, f we are, we have a meeting scheduled in the next few weeks to receive their feedback on those competencies and that should enable us to um, develop a, a similar performance management tool for represented employees. And only 237? We thought, um, you know, as our GM suggested, this is a large undertaking. Um, we have, um, I think it's 10,000 represented employees, so we needed to start somewhere. Because the 237 represents the largest faction of our workforce, and particularly the largest faction of our frontline workforce, it seemed like the most logical to engage them first. Once we've agreed with them on on a, a tool for evaluating represented employees, we'll begin that process with our other unions. Okay, and what other unions um, represented employees that were um, charged or you know part of this Throg's Neck scandal? So the largest employee at our de the largest employee population at our development is two thirty seven. The second largest is the DC thirty seven, which represents our clerical titles. Right. And we'll have to get back to you, but I don't believe that any of the staff at the Rogs Neck were represented by any other union other than 237. Okay. I think that all of them were 237. Okay. Right. I also want to go back for a minute, please, if I can, and correct the record. Right. Um, I misspoke earlier when I said that Tony, who is the director of materials management, reports for procurement. Um, I kind of like to generalize sometimes. Um, so the vice president for supply management oversees both materials management as well as procurement. So my apologies for kind of lumping them all together under procurement. I actually have a bill that requires agency heads to correct the record, so I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I take that as an expression of support. Okay. Can, can, I, can I correct I one other thing or <laughs> clarify? <laughs> Go ahead, please. Um, so we spoke about the passage of... A burst of, of truth-telling. <laughs> 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 
Um, we spoke about the passage of time between when the existing manager at Throx Next went out on medical leave and when the replacement was identified. Um, just to be clear, a posting was published for that position on March 6th. Um, the FMLA leave ended in late February, so there was only a gap of about a week before we began the process to replace um, the manager at Throg's Neck. I actually now want to jump to the DOI report um, about the resident leader, Monique Johnson. Do you have a response to the report? I do not. And what actions has NYCHA now taken after receiving this report? So after I received the report, I did have a conversation with the Inspector General um, and the Deputy Inspector, Inspector General. Um, and um, I had indicated to them that I would not take a close look at their at the, this particular report um, mm -hmm. immediately. That you would? That I would not look at it um, in not detail look at right, it. immediately. That it raised some concerns. Um, I, the one step that we did take, um, which is standard procedure, um, with respect to the, um, I believe that there was a, a finding <coughs> that perhaps the board wasn't the board that was elected as part of the process. Anytime there is a complaint that we receive um, with respect to the election process, either um, for the TA president or for the board, um, our um, resident engagement um, department takes a close look at, um, at that. Um, so they are engaging in that um, right now, that review. Um, with, with respect to the other um, allegations, um, sightings, um, I, have not, I have not taken any action on that Okay. at okay. this time. Okay. And um, just my last question on that. Um, with so many different changes um, and like just reorganizational changes and structure within the agency, um, are you looking to do any kind of changes within resident engagement? So we're taking a... And the reason why I ask that question is because there's a lot of attention and focus clearly on residents. And at this critical time, Resident engagement um, should be a strong, strong, strong um, division or department. And so um, nothing clearly can be business as usual. And so that's you know why I'm asking that question with such a heavy focus on sure. the residents and the strong voice and advocacy coming from the residents. What are you doing about resident So we um, have been taking a, a close look at all of our departments. Um, now with the monitor in place, um, there will be a, a full review um, of the complete organizational structure of the agency, um, and we've already had some very um, some positive uh, and constructive conversations with the monitor uh, and with his staff uh, <coughs> and about how to proceed. Um, so it's still early on in the process, but now these conversations will be um, done in conjunction with the monitor. Uh, I have a few more questions. I'll hand it off to Councilmember Joe and I. First, did, did NYCHA manage to get data on the response times in 2017, 2018, the service levels at the Rocks Neck? Not houses? yet. Okay. And I, one more question about inventory. Do you conduct either periodic or random audits of your inventory items? We will be, one, we, we take a risk, we, we do cycle counts. Depending upon how often the item is used, it may be done on the 30-day cycle, 60-day cycle, 90-day cycle. Mm -hmm. yeah, cycle. So and what, what's a cycle count, and how does that differ from an audit? Or well, what's going to happen in the system? It'll say there should be 10 of these. Do you want to talk into the mic? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good. Sorry, Nicole. Okay. So in the, in the system, it'll say there should be 10 of these items on the shelf. We'll count it and we'll determine, are there 10, is there eight, is there 12? And then that, that's a cycle count. Who's we? It, well, I'm sorry, my staff that will be taking over. No, no, okay, so I'm asking for the past. In the past, who was responsible, was there auditing of inventory items in NYCHA? 
so again with the 77 items 77 categories of items as and part of those are refrigerators and stoves the development supervisors were, were the storeroom person as well as the development supervisors were supposed to be doing counts on those was there but there was no independent audit of the inventory items independently of the development yeah not not that i'm aware of okay. I have a question about um, the mechanism for submitting complaints, right? Suppose I'm an employee at the Rockstack Houses and I either see or experience misconduct at the hands of a supervisor or a superintendent. What's the mechanism that exists for submitting complaints without fear of retaliation? So again, it would depend on the, the type of complaint. Um, so you would either um, bring your, your complaint to the Department of Equal Opportunity, yeah. uh, to the Office of the Inspector General, um, or to HR. Or, right? or safety. Or, or safety and security, thank you. So those are the four primary areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're unsure which of those areas the complaint actually falls under, which jurisdiction, then you should go to HR. Right? This is part of our um, new employee orientation, and where we do focus and stress on um, how to bring these types of complaints and, and where to go. Um, we also provide that in our manual that all employees receive. Um, and we, we need to do better um, in, in kind of reinforcing that on a, on a regular basis. Like I said, you know, given the outrageous nature of the conduct at drug stack houses, how could it be that so few people said nothing? Oh, I said, and, and I thought to myself, there could be confusion there could be fear. If I'm an employee and I'm a victim of an abusive workplace, you could, I could go to the Department of Equal Opportunity for complaints relating to discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. Or I could go to the Office of the Inspector General, which handles complaints relating to abuse, corruption, and fraud. Or I can go to the Office of Safety and Security, which handles complaints relating to safety and security. Or I could go to the borough office, which oversees local management, or I could go to the central office, which oversees both the borough and local management, or I can go to my local union, Teamsters 237 or GC37. Like there are six distinct units to which an employee could submit a pl complaint. D do you think the average NYCHA employee is familiar with all of these units and the jurisdictional differences between and among them? I think that most of our employees do know where to bring complaints to. And again, if they're unclear, they can certainly reach out to HR. And we also but you just acknowledged it was you're, you're doing orientation training because there is a lack of clarity about well, no, no, where to go to say That's standard, standard. That's standard for yeah. any new employee right? um, with the assumption that the person didn't work in government before. Um, so we, yeah. we lay out a, a process for them. Uh, we also provide... Can, can I offer a suggestion? If, if, if Think of city government, right? There are 50 agencies... And it would be odd if each agency had its own mechanism for a complaint, right? We have 311 because it's simple, it's clear. Whenever there's a problem, you call one number that can connect you to all the agencies in city government. Why not have a streamlined, simple, centralized hotline at NYCHA? That when in doubt, you call NYCHA's equivalent of 311 and we'll ensure that the complaint, so that all the information is stored in one place, all the complaints are funneled through one place, why not take a centralized, simplified approach? Well, because I mean, in the I, spirit of three one one. Sure, and I came. Well, so three one one is really not a complaint process for those types of complaints. So I've worked at city agencies in the past, as you well know, and no, so you could have a hotline for. Well, but city agencies have an, an equal opportunity officer, and you encourage staff to bring those those types of complaints directly to EEO. They're confidential. They're they're sensitive um, issues. So we encourage even at HPD, um, if there is an, um, an allegation of sexual misconduct, um, or uh, that you bring it directly to EEO. Right, but, but, but the, the we value- also, We also had yeah. the Office of the Inspector General. Right? We didn't have the exact equivalent of safety no, and security. But when, when you have a simple hotline, it's going to generate more complaints because people are clear about where to go. And if all the complaints, of, if, if, you're, if you're receiving various complaints about throw snack houses, whether it's equal opportunity complaints or safety and security complaints or DOI complaints, if all of that information is funneled through one hotline, it allows you as the general manager to see more clearly patterns of misconduct. We will certainly look into that and we'll discuss it with our partners at Department of Investigation. <coughs> they might not be agreeable to 
having the housing authority have a central complaint number where allegations of mm -hmm. uh, that would normally be referred directly to DOI would go to NYCHA first. Council Member John, I know you have questions. And actually one more, it, do all the all those six units that I identified where you could potentially submit a complaint, is there coordination or information sharing among all of those units? So there are handoffs. Yes. And they do cross referrals. So, so if someone comes to HR with an issue and HR determines the nature of the problem, requires it to be referred to equal opportunity because it's a just. No, no, I'm not asking about referral. I'm asking oh, okay. about um, does do representatives from equal opportunity, the inspector yes. general, safety and security, the borough office, central office, come together and share information? Not on a regular basis, on a case by case basis. That may happen, yes. Okay, so there's no consistent information sharing or coordination. It might, you might have a referral, but not consistent coordination or communication among these various avenues of There's a lot of complaints. information sharing and troubleshooting and managing the, these cases as they come forward. But to your point, we don't sit down like quarterly and, and review it all together. So we do the DEO. HR and so HR and DEO do, those two. yeah. Um, Councilor Marjona. Councilmember, do you want me to answer your question about service levels? At the Roxanne Houses, yes. Yes, okay. So, truthfully, if you 2017, always, yes. always. 2017 maintenance service levels were 1.6, and in 2018, maintenance service levels were 16.1. So, no, that's days? Days. So, in 2017, Nitro on average would respond. It says 1.6. 1. 1. 1.6, and then went to 16.1? 16.1. So that's a 1,600% increase in oh, collapse in productivity. Again, another red flag at the Rock Stack Houses. Um, no, actually, I might, I might look at this data a little differently and wonder why the service levels were so low given the, en the enormous number of work tickets that come in. So we would, I would be analyzing this a little further, right? Because there's ways we can look so at how work orders are open and closed and the productivity and the actual service. So there was service. fudging of numbers in 2017. I'm, I did not say that, sir. What's I said the, I would analyze can, that. Can I ask? It, it's, what, it's an unusually. We, we, we are taking a different approach to, okay. uh, to our work orders and when we close them. So 1.6 in 2017, 16.1 in 2018. What's the average? For maintenance. And maintenance. the average currently citywide is seven days. So either 1.6. Just for maintenance. Right, either 1.6. So the explanation is either there was number fudging or there was a collapse in productivity. Well, but in either case, it's a red flag about yes, it, it, the maintenance it's, it's of drugs. It's a very large uh, variance. I would also mention that last year we implemented a new policy on how they close the maintenance tickets, yeah. that they have to call first to document um, attempts to access. So that affects how many get closed. Councilmember Joni? Thank you, Chairs. Uh, you just opened up a whole other can of worms for me, but I, I'm going to try to stay focused. Um, Vito, were you disturbed to find out that there were 2,000 complaints that come in reference to NYCHA at the Department of Investigations a year on average? And that 350 of them actually lead some investigations each year? No, no, no I'm not disturbed. Doesn't it's not disturbing that that would equivalent to about for every five employees, one complaint a year on average and six complaints per complex a year? I think it would be helpful to n understand from the Department of Investigations how those statistics compare to other city agencies. I, mean, I, I don't know about I'm actually the encouraged by the fact that people are making reports to DOI. No, and, and, and I'm also encouraged by the fact that of the 2,000 referrals that were made, only 350 resulted in them opening up an investigation. Vito, that's one per day, seven days a week, including holidays. And we receive 3 million complaints a year. And if you look at the statistics that 311 received. This is not 311. This is DOI. And this is a problem of investigations. This is someone that knows where to actually make a complaint, and you have to search for that. It's not as accessible and, and as 311. Sir, with all due respect, when you are running an agency that is large as the city of Miami, right, you will have instances. 
you'll have situations and occurrences where that's required, that's necessary. I, I would love to say that we no longer need a Department of Investigations. We no longer need an Office of the Inspector General, but they serve a very um, clear function, right? a function, that, and I respect the work that they do. I s- Right. So, that goes without saying. And again, I don't know the nature, and we're also, we didn't ask what the nature of those investigations were. Right. Because I would also add that that, that hotline um, reporting <coughs> line is also used for the Section 8 program. So we really would need to have a breakdown of how many of those are employee-specific or resident complaints. I mean, there's a whole range of things that come that come forward. And if you add then a whole nother Section 8 program, it could be a landlord, it could be a tenant. So, so the commissioner provided need very a very high down. level yeah. um, numbers, but, but it, would I be disturbed if I saw a more detailed um, mm-hmm. a, a breakdown of what the complaints were and the type of conditions and complaints? It, it would disturb me. But again, it's not as if we have not been responsive to this. Um, and the commissioner also mentioned clearly too that there has been a collaborative working environment. Um, between the agency and the Department of Investigation. Um, and I think that the, um, the what happened at Throgsneck is a textbook example of how it should work, right? where the agency initiated an investigation um, where we did hit the wall, as the commissioner of DOI indicated, um, that we, and, and after we took action, um, we did a handoff to DOI. As opposed to us just closing out the case and saying, unfounded, nothing more to do. Right? So I think it, we have to take a look back um, and, and see what happened and what led to the events. Thank you for that. Chairman, I guess we have another request that I'm going to present to you that we actually uh, get in touch with DOI and get a breakdown of those 2,000 complaints. And uh, we'll see how they're categorized by complex and uh, get a better understanding and maybe we can help shape a better NYCHA experience for all. But let And I, as you know, we're holding a preliminary budget hearing on DOI so we can make that request in advance of the hearing. That That's great. Um, when it comes to valuations, and we know there's a very complicated area as you have uh, established, would there be any consideration for tenant evaluation of employees rather than just supervisors. We clearly had a structure where supervisors were evaluating um, their uh, co-workers, uh, but in this regard, who is, without all of the stakeholders being able to evaluate and who would know best of abuse or mistreatment than the actual stakeholders? In this regard, it would be tenant presidents and um, the board as well as the residents of a building. Uh, that could be helpful on giving a scorecard, which could also help the relationship and hold those employees accountable to the positions that they hold. Meaning, you come into my apartment, uh, are you going to complete the work satisfactory? If not, I'm going to grade you. Uh, this will be an ec- additional source of checks and balances, if you will. We do it across the board now with the NYPD. Uh, see something, say something. If you don't like the way you're being treated, here's the number, here's my name. You should report me. Um, and, it's and, and our residents currently have the ability to file a complaint um, or make a report against an employee um, to have residents evaluate the performance of every employee. I would not agree to that. Every experience. We do it with the NYPD. We have more NYPD officers than there are employees at NYCHA. If you get pulled over, they're supposed to give you a card, introduce themselves, and say, if you feel that your rights have been uh, stepped on or your civil liberties have uh, n- uh, been uh, abused, here's a card, here's a number, please make the phone call. But I'm sorry, I think that we're talking about two different things. What is that? Our residents currently have the ability to file a complaint against an employee. I think that that just answers your question about with, with respect to how the police department no, operates. But so what you're suggesting, I think I heard you say earlier, that you wanted the ability for our residents to evaluate the performance of every employee. Right? And if they have a complaint, if they have a concern no. about an employee, there's a mechanism for them to file that complaint. Vito, we had a similar program for NYPD where you can actually call in. Very few people knew about it and very few people did anything about it until we made a program that allowed the New York City residents 
to actually be informed by giving them a name and a number that they could take advantage of right there and then. And our chair here would be able to help because he helped cater that bill and maybe further explain the intent and the purpose. And Chairman, if I'm wrong here and I'm off the off target, please help me. The bill, it's a business card that an officer hands out, which mm -hmm. informs you of your right to call 311, which you could do as a NYCHA resident in relation to NYCHA employees. Right. But it's, may I? Yeah. Oh, wait, I, this, raise your hand. I, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth <coughs> in the testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Retired Chief Gerald Nelson, civilians do not give evaluations to police officers. There are so many mechanisms where they can make complaints. Giving out your card, giving out your name, showing your ID card, showing your ID card, showing your shield is not an evaluation, sir. You can make any complaint that you want. You have so many different agencies, CCRB, right to our department. You see some EEO, you can make a complaint to EEO, but that is not an evaluation. I think you're mixing that up, sir. First of all, I want to thank you for the service. Uh, you said thank general? You. No, <laughs> chief. Chief. 41 years, borough commander. So and my name is Gerald Nelson, not general. General. Three star chief, Three not star general. Chief. Yes, sir. I That's want to thank you for your service. Actually, close enough to a general. No. If, if I, I want to elaborate. When you know the, the the term evaluation doesn't mean a scorecard of how did they perform satisfactory or not. We we should be thinking outside our box and how to improve the environment and the experience of both employee and tenant relations here which is there's clearly a breakdown that we can all admit. Um, and coming up with a creative mechanism which will help improve not only the environment but the relationship and the courtesy that goes along with it, which I've heard and I've seen firsthand from both tenants that can be abusive to employees and vice versa employees of NYCHA facilities being abusive to our tenants. We have both here. But the higher standard and ethical responsibility should be on the employee or the employer in this regard, which would be NYCHA overall, as well as anyone that works at a NYCHA facility, that they should be held accountable to some type of ethical approach to the issues that tenants raise. And making, and I just can't believe I felt like I was just jumped on because I felt that I brought up something that we're holding to, what's the number of NYPD officers, 40,000? A little less than 50,000 50, New York City employees. About 39,000 uniform and an additional 11 to 12,000 civilians. A man of statistics, I love it. So. If we can have this entire law enforcement be responsible by giving out cards and saying, ma'am or sir, if here's my information, if you feel that there, we have stepped on your civil liberties or rights, please feel free to make a complaint about me, builds a relationship where the cordial environment of that officer approaches our citizens in a different manner. And, and this isn't to threaten or strong them, but that is a form of an evaluation. I, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with you, sir, but when you utilize the terminology evaluations, you can rate our employees. We're all for that. How are our guys and gals doing within our developments? You can rate them. You can put a, a 1 to 10 and rate them. But when you say evaluations, we had a long discussion about evaluations. And I just think maybe you used the wrong terminology when you said that NYPD cops are evaluated by, this, by civilians. Yes, they are, but there's not a formal way that you can just write up something and evaluate that cop and he's rated on that. We rate our people all the time, and your idea is a good idea, but just maybe the terminology that you use is a little misleading, sir. Uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, if we can hold our brave men and women in blue to one standard, I think we can hold our um, employees of NYCHA to the same standard, uh, but that's a different discussion. 
Getting back to and that's question. standard being a business card, uh, right? Uh, simple, simple with information on. You know what? Maybe you're not not aware that three one one is an option for you to complain if you're not if you feel that I have not performed my responsibilities or treated your issue in a professional manner with courtesy and respect. Please make a phone call. That could go a long way on shaping how we interact with and and sir, with all the I don't have the statistics with me. But our residents do use 311 to file complaints with respect to service. You know, I don't want to keep it. They, uh, they had the same option for the NYPD, but yet we saw that there was a need to do, go a little bit further than that. And we, will, and, we, will and we should be looking for ways to go further with our NYCHA employees. Appreciate it. Um, the chairman mentioned uh, inventories, and this is something I discussed with them a little bit earlier. Um, currently, or previously, there was no mandatory list of inventory on uh, how many lawnmowers and major equipment was at a facility that was mandatory that they would keep logs on? Kathy, what is that what I understood? No, we didn't say there wasn't. We said there was mm. a, a number of categories that are part of ongoing inventory tracking of which there are 77 categories that we do track in our systems and in addition we do what's called cycle count so of other inventory it may not be in our database system but we do inventory and QC counts on the supplies that are in our uh, developments if I may also add uh, <clears throat> excuse me items are tagged if they're over a certain value and that that's maintained mostly on equipment that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Such as like leaf blowers, weed whackers, snow over, blowers, lawn mowers, sorry. drills, saws, and brand new pallets of sand. If they're over a certain dollar amount, presently it's $5,000. So, a lawn mower, a ride on lawn mower is several thousand dollars. There's no accountability for that. We don't know. It's two thousand. It's not five thousand or six thousand. No one would know how many units are at a complex or how often they order a replacement. Yes, we would know how often they order it. Absolutely. Again, so, council members, I think it's, it's also important. We talked about this, I think, um, several times already today. That um, even though the drugs, what we're, why we are here today is because of an event that happened in the past. Right? We're forward looking. Right? And we want to continue to be forward looking. And we recognize the fact that there have been deficiencies in a number of different areas, ranging from micro purchases to inventory control. We're putting a lot of these controls in place. Again, it's not as easy as a switch that you turn off and on. Right? And I think that we've made a lot of progress in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's no question about it. Right? And you're raising some ver very important issues um, you know, with respect to what at what dollar value or what level do, should we um, should we track um, equipment that we use? And again, we're talking about we are, for all practical purposes, a major city. Right? We are the size of the city of Miami. Right? We have th 318 developments. Right? We employ almost 11,000 staff. Right? Um, if you took the physical footprint of the of housing authority, we would be three times the size of Central Park. Right. So yes, this is it's a huge undertaking. It's a no huge undertaking to drill to get down to the level of a power saw. I'm not going to tell you that that's a priority for me. Right. Obviously, we're going to start to prioritize. We're going to look at the dollar value. We're going to look at what has happened in the past appliances. Um, the commissioner of DOI talked about um, uh, kitchen cabinets that were, were were taken. These are important issues for us. Right. So we're going to prioritize. Um, and we're going to stay focused on this. I just want to add, I don't think this is just about Throg's Neck because there apparently is a culture because 2,000 complaints, and I go back to the number, I'm sure they're not all from Throg's Neck that gets well, in the so DOI. Also, these changes are not just about Throg's Neck. We're, right. These changes, so there's a cultural that we're looking we're at. We're out citywide, all five boroughs, mm -hmm. right, every development. That's the point. And I just want I know that, thank you for the courtesy, uh, chairs. Um, I want to get back to the TA president um, and offices that 
tenant associations use. Is it common practice to have a, a, a stove in a tenant association office? Is it rare? Is it something that's unheard of? So I, I, what I will tell you is just from my um, experience in the last year, um, I have seen stoves in other um, TA offices. Can I tell you I've seen one in every single one? I can't tell you that. Um, but is it unique to Throg's Neck? No, it's not. Okay, thank you. And, and some so of the TA offices are in uh, units that are that are offline for right. the purpose. So right. they have that type of equipment in them. Right. And it's truthfully similar. something that we're moving away from because we shouldn't be utilizing um, apartments for a TA office space. Um, they should be going to, to families that, that need them. I agree with you. Uh, that's certainly a, something that we should be changing, making more units available to New Yorkers. We are uh, doing the best we can. Great. And it's, I same a question for security cameras. Is this completely unheard of in a office to have uh, security cameras? So, um, again, um, I can't say that I – I'm usually pretty good. I'm usually, I usually pick up on, on things when I'm out in the field. Um, I can't say for certain – that I've seen security cameras in other um, TA offices, office space or not. Um, what I can say, and I don't want to be um, to be contradictory or to be disrespectful to, to the commissioner of DOI, um, I do want to have further conversations with them mm. uh, about the purchase of, of this equipment right. uh, and whether it was um, a proper purchase or not. I, I, what I will tell you is that, um, and I'll tell you, just this is just me talking personally, and if that request had come to me, I probably would have approved it, right, given the circumstances. And when I say given the circumstances, um, what I looked at at Throg's Neck is that we, the, the Housing Authority, installed almost 300 security cameras throughout the development. Right. So clearly right, there is a reason why we installed that many security cameras um, to suggest that security cameras at the TA office um, were unjustified or, or a misappropriation of spending, I need to have a conversation with uh, with the Inspector General's office about that. Mm. And, and there was much talk about general fund versus TA money that should have been used and the complications. And, and again, there are very strict requirements under HUD regulations as to how the TPA funds can be used. Um, again, I think with further conversations with our, our partners at the Department of Investigation to get a clear understanding as to um, how they made that, that determination, why they put that language in their report. Um, I, I think we really need to clarify that. So I'm also concerned, um, I think for the right reasons, of the 325 complexes that we have, and that's 325 10 association presidents. We revalue re the role that they play in improving the lives and the um, conditions that the tenants of NYCHA live in. Uh, they play a significant role. I um, and I would hate to have their reputations tarnished across the board or the, or the notion that they could be grilled for being passionate about issues that are impacting their complexes and their tenants with a pushback of, you know, see something, say something, but if you say too much, you know, you can find yourself uh, being reported. So... These are concerns that I'm afraid of and abuses that can become systematic. Um, and this is where right. the power of management um, over TA presidents and tenants and the abuses that we know exist and outside of Throg's Neck yeah. uh, in itself well, have I, been I, evident. I, I agree with you 100% that I, I value tremendously the importance of, of our resident um, of resident presidents and the, and the boards. Um, I make a point every time I go out to a development um, to try to meet with the TA president. Um, I have had meetings with them after hours. I will tell you that the relationship I have with Ms. Johnson, um, she has, and I agree with you 100%, I don't think you can describe her any differently than passionate. Right? She's passionate, she's outspoken. Um, she is um, my report card. Right. She's the one who evaluates me. An evaluator, huh? Uh, she is an evaluator, um, as most TA presidents that I have met. Um, they understand completely the role that they play. Um, they represent their members, uh, their constituents, their fellow residents um, in a way that is, is commendable. Right. I 
But yeah, oftentimes because of personality issues, they may not get along with the staff at the property level. Um, and that has to, that's something that we all need to work on. Um, and, and I've heard from TA presidents as well, right, that they also recognize the fact that they need to do better as well. So it's a two-way street. Thank you for that. My last question. Do you actually do work orders after a uh, job has been completed in an apartment where a te tenant actually signs off that, yes, my repair was made? Yes. Yeah. You know, that evaluation, that uh, we'll call it the evaluation. Um, is there any question on there that says, has the work been performed to your satisfaction? Yes. In a professional an manner? They can check, and they can check it or not, or they yes. can refuse. Or they can say they uh, the work has completed not in a well, professional yes. manner. I would also so isn't hope that, that a form of an evaluation? Yes. I would hope that they wouldn't sign the work order if they weren't satisfied with the work that, that we did. Happen. So isn't that a, a type of evaluation that is done by the tenant on an ongoing basis? It is, and there are other forms of it as well. We have other surveys. We have other QAs we do. We Great. Also do. So maybe, thinking outside of the box and hearing what the, um, uh, the feedback was, maybe on that form we can also put on if you feel that the work or the treatment that you received was contrary to the experience that you would have wished, please call blank to complain with a number, whether it be 311, and it's not going to be an un fair burden that's placed and we hope that we can do it in languages that tenants can understand but um, again this is being creative to address a real problem uh, thank you I have a few more questions I want to I was struck by your comment earlier that w with respect to the DOI report on 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 the resident council leader at the Roxnick houses you said you were you were not going to review it closely well, I'm sorry. I've, yeah. I, I've read it over repeatedly. Yeah. I've met with the Inspector General and the Deputy Inspector General. There was um, nothing in that report that that I felt required immediate um, action. Um, that's probably a better description. And, and it seems like you're skeptical that even the purchase of the camera system was improper. Do you disagree with DOI's finding in that respect? I think it requires additional conversations with the uh, Department of Investigation, um, again, as to how they came to that conclusion and determination. Uh, and I've, I've said this on record. Um, again, if a TA president were to make that request of me directly, um, I would consider it. I'm not saying that I would outright approve it, but I, th I would take um, other other issues into The reason I ask is I'm sensing some skepticism. And the reason I ask is given all the problems affecting NYCHA, given the systemic failures that we've highlighted, is, you know, DOI is a law enforcement agency, a criminal law enforcement agency, right? A DO, you know, at, at, at Best, a DOI finding can result in reputational damage. At worst, a DOI finding could result in an arrest. Is it a productive use of DOI's resources to target a TA leader I as opposed to the deeper that. challenges? With all well, the, the reason I'm asking you is because the $3 million that funds the offer, Office of the NYCHA Inspector General comes from NYCHA's budget, right? So is, is that the kind of use of resources that NYCHA envisions for DOI? <laughs> And again, I think that that question should be posed to the commissioner of DOI. Yeah. Um, the DOI, the the relationship that I have had with the office of the inspector general um, has been positive. It's been collegial. Yeah. I think we've accomplished a lot together. No, I, and I agree, but I think there's bigger fish to fry I, I don't than, want to answer than though, as no offense to Monique Johnson. I don't yeah. think. I think there are more serious challenges at NYCHA than yeah. one tenant leader. But I honestly um, can't answer as to why um, – that report was released. I think you need to ask that directly of DOI. And I think we do have to have a further conversation with them about um, the interpretation of the use of the TPA funds, about what's allowed under HUD regulations, um, and, uh, and whether or not these expenditures were um, improper or not. It's a conversation that I do want to have with them. And it's a conversation that I did have with them already. But again, um, in the Bigger that, that, like, that's kind of troubling. Uh, one assumes that when DOI is crafting these reports, it's conferring with the Housing Authority. You're telling me that DOI declared a purchase improper without finding out from NYCHA whether it was, in fact, improper? Or? Again, I don't know if they spoke with anyone within the authority. They certainly, I did not speak with them about that report prior to it coming out. Um, I don't know if they conferred with anyone else in the department. Right. Yeah. Just my opinion, DOI has bigger fish to fry, and there, I think there are deeper challenges that have been highlighted in this uh, hearing. Do you have a system in place for tracking irregularities in overtime? Um, we have 
um, reporting uh, by every payroll period that categorizes what we refer to as scheduled and unscheduled overtime. Mm -hmm. So we can monitor that information across the entire agency and then it is broken down by department and is further broken down by individual developments. So it requires management to do reviews of their overtime to look for any spikes or trends that would tell you that there is um, a concern and occasionally we do uh, find high usage at certain locations which would lead us to investigate what's going on here and there can certainly be justifications um, the classic would be heating season the heating department you'll see spikes if you look at temperature or weather conditions you know and what the staff were doing you can find justifications or not um, so, so or, when or a, when overtime trends. One irregularity is a spike in the use of overtime at a given moment. Spike from a comparative, we'll look back, we can look back on the global report th back three years. So we can look for trends. Okay. And in the case of the rocks and the houses, did you see a spike? Yes, we saw a and spike that the, summer. Did the spike prompt an investigation? The spike prompted a follow-up with the director and the regional asset manager to discuss why there was such a huge increase and it was related to the waterline sewer uh, breaks that required the additional staff to work 24-7. So at that time, there was a um, acceptable justification of why it was going up. And when the contractor completed those repairs towards the end of the summer, I believe, um, there was plus our control. So you said this was a leak there or a plumbing, a a plumbing issue? So, so Water main. there was actually a break in the, in the uh, sewer line. Um, did, did, from a building to the street. Did that explain the 40%? Does that in and of itself explain the 40% increase? From I think it accounted for, for some of it, for, yeah. For a lot of it. Um, yeah. Which is honestly why, and again, this was in like the first few months of, of me um, coming into the authority, um, which is why I wanted to get the work expedited. Right. right? Um, honestly, that's not the best use of our um, dollars, right, is to have someone sit there and watch a pump to ensure that a pond of raw sewage doesn't overflow. Right, as opposed to actually getting the repairs made. Yeah. Right? And that's what I charged the staff with, and that's what they reported to me, uh, back to me on a daily basis with pictures. Mm -hmm. I wanted, because I couldn't get up there every day, and I wanted to see pictures of the progress that was being made. Um, and again, going back to um, the relationship with the, um, with the TA presidents, um, I was getting reports from some very reliable sources outside of the Housing Authority. Um, namely the uh, TA president, as to the progress that was being made um, at the site, at the location. And, and again, forward-looking, we're putting in place, um, and I believe the it, it's being implemented um, within the next uh, two months, um, is a new approval process for overtime. That would re and it's electronic, so it's all documented in our system. That would require from the development level, from the supervisor level, up through the property manager and then beyond regional asset managers, borough directors, um, for the use of overtime. Okay, so I just want to summarize. Um, NYCHA is going to improve the tracking of local contracts in order to prevent mismanagement of funds at the local level. Is that? You're specifically, yes, micro-purchase. Micro-procurements, yes. micro-purchase. Correct. Right. So can you commit to updating both the Investigations Committee and the Public Housing Committee on the progress that you make on that front? Absolutely. Okay. Knight is committed to improving the tracking of your property, your equipment, your supplies, in order to prevent theft, destruction, loss of property. Is that at the local level? And again, that will be rolled out um, by development because, again, we can't implement that um, throughout the entire city at one time. But you can commit to keeping us posted yes. on the progress on those fronts. Okay. Uh, you're uh, going to make uh, the process of securing overtime more rigorous approvals, higher approvals? Is that That's already yeah, yeah. correctly? Okay. Correct. How do we? And this would be this is going to be my final question. Uh, how how do we prevent a, a repeat of Throgsnap? You know, if you know, as I noted earlier, if you have a development that's gone long a long stretch of time without property management that has the highest overtime expenditures in the city, that saw a spike in overtime from 2017 to 2018, 
that, uh, that has dubious service level numbers, either as a result of number fudging or collapse in productivity, and a development about which there were various complaints of an abusive workplace culture. How do we ensure that those kind of developments come under a microscope, that not just pro proactively investigating problems? So I, I don't think that there's a silver bullet. Um, I think a lot of what we talked about. What I'm, I'm thinking like almost like, you know, there's an HPD, there's enhanced review or enhanced scrutiny for troubled contractors, right? It, it, could there be a process of enhanced scrutiny or enhanced review for unusually distressed developments? And I do believe that we have been more focused on that. And, and it's unfortunate, again, that a situation that occurred at Throg's Neck is what brought us to that point. Um, and I think we're using the data that we are a very data rich agency. Um, I don't think we have been using the data um, to the best possible use. Um, we have started um, having NYCHA stat meetings, which I understand had happened in the past. Um, again, unfortunately, they were for reasons that I can't answer. Um, they had stopped. Um, we started them again. And it, it's really, it's, it's a great... And what, is, what are the nature of those meetings? So we, we focus on different areas. So we but will... Who's in the... Because I know in, in, the, in CompStat meetings, it's the chief of the department, as I understand, is meeting with, with precinct commanders. So or are you meeting directly all the management, with so directors, managers and borough directors? I am there. Right, yep. The EVPs, the chair, yep. right, the, the interim chairs, interim yeah. chairs. Uh, have been there. What, what about the local property managers who are the equivalent of a precinct committee? It depends on the topic. Each uh, month we have different topics. So if it is related to their performance, if we if we invited all those people, there'd be no one uh, running the ship. But uh, on occasion we do bring them in if it's like, you know, a topic that we need them to respond to or hear about. But again, it's also at the, it's at the borough director level, the regional asset manager levels. Right. Um, you know, and again, I also want to go back to what I had said earlier too, um, is we have a, the monitor in place now. And, you know, we, a lot of what we're discussing today and, and a lot about the forward looking and improvements that we will be making will be done working with the monitor, mm -hmm. right? They're coming in with a team that have expertise in, in a variety of different areas. Um, so we look forward to working with them in a collaborative way um, and to learning from this experience right, and making improvements. I, I thank you for your testimony. I have no further questions. I'll just um, end by saying that I, I really hope that um, what comes out of this hearing is a better process for disciplining the on a managerial level and that um, we create an environment that encourages residents to, um, you know, to continue to be leaders and be able to share uh, what they're seeing and what they're hearing. Because I constantly say that I feel like there's always a disconnect between what's happening on the, the development level and what's being communicated to the executive level. Mm -hmm. And if residents feel like if they do say something, there's some retaliation, then what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. And so I really hope that we um, make sure that the processes are in place to really discipline the bad actors mm -hmm. and encourage the residents to continue to, to speak up and, and speak out and know that they have the support. And it's up to NYCHA to put that in place. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next panel will consist of Monique Johnson, who's the resident council president of the Rocks Houses. I never thought the right to know act would come to the 
Mm, we're just concerned about making. And then I'll swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I, I think it'll need to be turned on. Do you see a red light on yours? Okay. I do. I'm going to I'm going to elaborate on the handouts. <sighs> Please. I also have um some pictures that I want to show as well. So you could just hand them my phone, okay. and they could just pass the phone down. Okay. Okay. Ms. Johnson, would you mind sitting down, or? I make you nervous. No, it's just. <laughs> I don't want to set a precedent for allowing I'm, people to stand. I'm a little high. No, please. I mean, that's... Um, okay. You have as much time as you need. So. Okay. So, Exhibit A. The cell phone. That's Exhibit A. So you can just move um, move the screen to the right. And what you're looking at is the ground shop. No, you're looking at a building, am I correct? Yeah. Beams? Okay, so that is building number 2745 Shalai Avenue. The beams to that building was painted purple by the supervisor of grounds, Brianne Pawson. If you just slide to the right, you'll see the wall of the ground shop on Dewey Avenue on the side of 2805 Dewey Avenue. The wall to the ground shop was painted purple, and that is still today, painted purple. And we can confirm that what you're saying is accurate. Yep. Okay. That's where the purple paint in my bathroom came from. So they didn't purchase purple paint for me. I got the leftover because everyone knows I like purple. But they painted my bathroom because I had mold in my bathroom. So the ticket numbers to the mold and the paint. Okay, we're going to start out with June 22nd, 2018. The paint number is 5937121121. The mold came back. They had to repaint it. That ticket number was created January 4th. 2019. That ticket number is 649-99720. That is how 
New York City Housing Authority came to paint my bathroom. They were not threatened. They were not forced. They were not intimidated. It was their duty to clean the mold and paint my bathroom. We clear? Yep. Crystal clear. But your point is that there was precedent there was precedent for using pur purple in public housing outside yes. the apartment. Okay. Yes. The paint was already purchased. Okay. It was leftover paint from the beams and the wall, the outside wall that they used. So I used that paint or they used that paint to paint my bathroom. I'm happy we solved purple gate. So mm -hmm. Exhibit B. And Exhibit B is? The two page. Not too many documents in front of me. This is an email that I sent to Mr. Wallace Vereen, who was the superintendent at that time. This email was sent to him on June 19th, 2018. CC'd, carbon copied to this email was the borough director, Ms. Allen. And at that time, the deputy director, asset management manager, Derek Powell. And the email reads as follows. Please be advised I am still waiting for the front entrance to my door to be completed with the intercom service and the security camera hooked up to my computer. The summer months are here and my office is most busy in the summer months. The response <clears throat> by Mr. Ravine, who was the superintendent, was the last time the vendor came out to your office, he said that your buzzer slash intercom was working. I do recall that was another employee coming out to look at your door. I will follow up and get back to you. Are you requesting to be able to view the camera that was installed in front of your office to your computer? You can't see my reply here, but my reply was yes. It was nothing out of the norm. These were the same cameras that was installed in the management office and at the ground shop, the same cameras that the Department of Investigation came and confiscated because they used that as part of investigating all of the scandal that was going on. These cameras were not part of CCTV. These was cameras that they had installed through an outside vendor. So they used that same vendor to install the cameras at my location, my office. But the reason why I submitted this, because they're trying to imply that I was forcing and intimidating. Nowhere in this email do it speaks of me forcing or intimidating. Not only that, there are three levels of supervisors connected to this email. The superintendent, his immediate supervisor, which is Derek Powell, and then the borough director. So if there was an issue with them um, installing the camera or my intercom service at any given point, any one, any three of the supervisors could have intervened and said no. They did not. So I will proceed with reading. Can we please, oh, and then I ask for all the benches in the development to be fixed and painted because summer months are approaching. The same contractor that painted my bathroom did my camera in my office, my intercom system, and painted the benches. The reason why I'm saying that is because you made mention of those contractors that they used that were under 5,000. Okay, so in layman terms, 
how we say it, how we refer to it, those are the contractors that they used and got kicked back from. You understand that? Yeah. Okay. Steering. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to go to Exhibit C. This is one sheet. This is another email. This email is from the superintendent at the development, Mr. Wallace Ravine, and it's to myself. And CC'd on this is Derek Powell and the borough director. And he's advising me, Ms. Johnson, we contacted PC Richards regarding the stove. They only have a 30 inch stainless steel electric stove in stock. Ms. J agreed to the stove we are ordering today. No force, no intimidation. I just want to elaborate on the stove. So, the office to my address is 475 Swinton Avenue. My office is connected to the building 471 Swinton. There was a gas outage in 471 Swinton Avenue. The entire building was without gas, front and back. So the front of the building is 471. The back address is 2786 Dewey Avenue. That consisted of 70 apartments. Because there was a gas outage and my office is connected to that building, my gas was out as well in my office. I had a 36 inch gas stove. When they repaired the gas outage, they had to convert my gas line into an electric line because the building is so old, it wasn't up to code. So they had to convert it which means that I can no longer use my 36 inch gas stove. So it was only appropriate that when they took the 36 inch gas stove out, they replaced it with a 36 inch electrical stove. They weren't forced, they weren't intimidated, they weren't made, it was a request that I made all three supervisors was on it. It was approved, and I got the stove. This is the same stove that I use to feed my community with. This is the same stove that I use to feed NYCHA staff with. So when we did, when we did the transferring of staff, the morale was so low. The resident council and some of the residents in the development, we got together and cooked food and we barbecued for the staff just to try to bring up the morale. Not too long ago, we had a blist at my development. We had over 40 staff come to my development. They worked from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We were grateful because we need the extra help. So we got together and we wanted to show our appreciation. And how did we do that? I went in that office and I cooked on that 36 inch electric stove. And we fed every maintenance worker that was at that development that day. We cooked dinner for them. Not only did we cook for them, during my family often get mad at me. Thanksgiving is a day when you spend with your family. You, I got to I gotta open up the office. I got to have food there because during the holiday seasons, the depression rate goes up. A lot of people are without family. They don't have, my thing is we got to leave the doors open. We got to provide food, you know, for those who are in need. So I told my family, I said, you know what? Yeah, we can spend it together, but we got to do it in my office. And that's what we do. 
So those are some of the things that I use the stove for. The stove is not for my own personal use because I have a stove in my apartment, a 24-inch stove I have in my apartment. So those are just some of the things that we use the stove in the office for. Um, the election process. During the election process, the TA presidents have the option of finding a consultant and they could man the election process, or you can allow housing to do the election process. I always opt to allow NYCHA to do the election process because if something goes wrong, I don't want to be held accountable. So the election process that they're speaking of, they were in full control over. Monique Johnson was nowhere near the building until 8 o'clock until it was time for me to vote. So everything that... The Department of Investigations is alleging I did, NYCHA was in full control. I had no monies in my possession, therefore I am unable to mismanage any funding. Any funding. You cannot mismanage something you have no control over. Um... Are there any questions for Ms. Johnson from the council? I'll, I'll attempt a few questions. Um, so my, my position, and I made it clear to uh, the general manager, is that DOI has bigger fish to fry than tenant association leaders. But, and you disagree with the investigative findings. Do you think as a tenant leader, did you receive preferential treatment or favorable treatment from the housing authority? No. I. I do not feel like I get special treatment. However, um, I work very hard on maintaining a relationship with the housing authority. And because there is relationship, a lot of times it make things go a lot smoother. So um, with all of the stuff that was going on in my development, the reason why you didn't hear a whole lot of yelling and screaming from, from me is because I was in constant communication with the executive department, with the borough, as, as to what was going on. So um, they didn't keep me in the blind. I, I was well aware that they were working behind the scenes, um, and I was okay with that. I have to admit that some of the things I didn't agree with, but because some of this was new to me and because there was relationship, I said, allow this process to take place and see what happens. And if it doesn't work in the favor of the residents, they know that they're going to hear from me. So this is why I was able to sit back and allow the process to take place. Um, it has always been the tactic of New York City Housing Authority, and now I'm, I'm understanding the tactic of the Department of Investigation to retaliate. This is why people are afraid to speak up. There are employees who would not speak to the Department of Investigation, but spoke to me. And even though they don't live in Thras Neck, most of our caretakers are residents themselves. I, they just live in other developments. I, so I took that responsibility on, and I stood for them as well. So the commissioner brought you up in her testimony, and I want to read the following paragraph, and can you tell me whether whether it's accurate. Quote, our, our thorough and independent investigation refuted claims that Throg's next staff were having what had been described as orgies, both on and off NYCHA premises. Significantly and thankfully, DOI found no evidence of the alleged sex parties or sexual misconduct involving residents or children. 
indeed in the course of DOI's investigation, Tenant Association President Johnson and other Tenant Association officers recanted the allegations that they made to the media about personally witnessing parties, drinking, or sexual misconduct and the existence of the recorded evidence of this behavior. Is this true, false, what's? That is false information, and I have the recording on here too, so that, that can be exhibit D if you need. But when I, did, when I did the first press release, when this first happened and I did the press release, yes, I spoke of uh, sexual orgies, and I said it was alleged. And the reason why I said it was alleged is because I was not there. I did not share in any of those orgasms. So, so. <laughs> Did you, so you, did you ever claim that you personally witnessed? No. I, okay. What I said was I was told. Okay. I heard. Okay. What I said was I heard there were videos, but I did not have videos did, in my possession. I did have pictures, and I did show them some of the pictures I had, and I have some pictures in my phone still today. That can be exhibit E, if you like. Okay. Um, so, in your opinion, you did not. It's you not simply an opinion. Repeating, that's fact. It's, it's recorded. It's recorded no, not, by the media. No, you, it's you, recorded. No, I said l- alleged. L- 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 let me finish my question. You were simply repeating what you had been told. You, yes. Okay. Yes. You you did not intend to fabricate stories about sex parties and and throgs and No, I'm gonna correct you now. It's yeah. not that I didn't attend. I did not. Okay, you did not. Okay. I did not. Fair enough. Um. The report mentions over 100,000 in unspent TPA funds. I don't know if you want to comment on that. What is their comment? I, I haven't used that. Okay, what, that's fair. What, yeah, I, that's... what is their comment? What, you don't understand? I didn't use it. Okay. It seems like an unusually high amount. Is there a reason for not using? Because I haven't used it in years. Okay. Is there is and and the numbers are still in action. And by the way, I'm not asking. There's nothing wrong with not using TPA. No, no. But I'm curious to know: is there are there impediments to using it? Is that a choice? It's a choice okay. for me, and um, I don't agree with the numbers. The numbers are incorrect. So that's an incorrect number. Okay. Yes, it should be much more than that, um, and I've shared that. Um, that is an ongoing issue for many of the resident leaders. Um, I didn't agree to the new contract. I have not signed it. So the money has been stepped over so many times. I don't want no parts of it. I don't want to be connected to it. Had I been using that money, then we would be sitting here talking about mismanagement of funds for real. So I just, um, process of elimination. I just, I'm playing it safe. And I know sometimes people might think that if you're not using the TPA funds, you're not doing anything on behalf of the residents, but um, how were you able to get other funding for the residents? So you know that I do events almost every month and I invite everybody. And all my events are done by sponsorship and donation. I refuse to say who my sponsors are or donations because I don't want nobody trying to rain on my parade. <laughs> and also, um, do you receive funding for, um, from elected officials or other organizations at all? <laughs> for the Resident Association? You are my business. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's okay, yes. and that's just that's just for the record, so people can no, know that yes, it's not just yes, for TPA. Yes. I, my um, elected officials, um, <laughs> yes, they do get involved. Um, they have to get involved with Thrall's Neck, and yes. But I also want to speak to uh, the fact that they said I collect two hundred dollars a month, or me and my board members collect $200 a month. That is false information. HUD allows the resident leaders up to $200 a month when you go to district meetings. My district has not had a meeting in I don't know how long. But even when they were meeting, I stopped going because I didn't find it 
to be productive. So I haven't gone to a district meeting in over three years. And when I was going, it was $100. But I have not received any of that money in a minimum of three years. So that was another allegation that is incorrect. Okay. And in a perfect world, if you were able to make some changes at NYCHA in order to be more um, helpful and supportive of residents, um, what do you think the changes should be? I, I don't know if we, I got time for that. I don't know if I got time to tell that whole story. But in all fairness, um, in all fairness, I would say that we need to have a better relationship with NYCHA and the residents because once there is an open dialogue and there's relationship, it opens up the door for... Um, for what? It opens up the door for partnership. It opens up the door for partnership. Mm -hmm. That's another resident leader. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It opens up the door for partnership. Not only that, um, yeah, well, partner, yeah. And how can we be helpful as a council? Y'all not ready for my answer, so I'm... Oh, honestly. Because I don't feel like you're helpful. I don't. I came in here. I I don't. Um, the cameras are on now, so everybody's on their best behavior. You know, everybody's an entertainer. But what we do when the cameras are not on, are we available? Do we make ourselves accessible? You know, um, before today, I haven't spoken to you. I haven't spoken to you, Richie. You said you know me for years. You're absolutely right. You didn't reach out to me not one time. So, yeah, mm -hmm. start right there. Start right there. Okay. So, and I understand we all got a lot. Let me respond to that because you just. Can I, was I, I, I cannot finish. I, I'm, 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 I'm the chair, so I'm going to. I was advised by legal, I was advised by legal counsel. Not to speak not to, to you reach out to me? because you were the target of a DOI report, so I had to maintain ob objectivity. That is the reason. So, well, I just, I just think that, um, I think that relationship goes a long way. You know, we don't have to be best friends. We don't have to go out and drink. I don't even drink, but um. Relationship goes a long way. You know, doing this whole process, I was so angry because it was all lies. And I'm like, these people know me. These people know me, especially people that know me 10 years plus. They know me. And nobody reached out to me. I was so angry. I was hurt. I felt betrayed. I did. But because of who I am, I didn't give up. And I was like, I'm not giving in. And that's the message that I want to send to all the resident leaders. No matter what, do not allow this to implant fear in you and allow that fear to paralyze you. A lot of resident leaders don't speak up for this reason because they are fearful of being retaliated. <clears throat> so I had to make it very clear I don't need a position to advocate. I don't need a position to stand for righteousness. I come to do the job of my father who sent me. So my attitude is you can't touch me. You ain't make me and you cannot break me. And that is my attitude. I just wanna, I have a few more questions, but I, I should note that among the members of the committee, there was considerable skepticism and criticism about DOI's report. So that's just something worth noting. It would um, have been nice for somebody to say that to me. Yeah. So the facts, when did you first hear about the abusive work, workplace environment at the Roxnack Houses? Do you remember when you first? The abuse of. When did you first hear complaints about the abusive workplace environment at the Roxnack Houses? 
I don't know. You don't remember. Okay. But it's, it's, it, it was sometime. It was sometime. <laughs> um, I was skeptical. I seen it. Um, I heard it. Um, I spoke to one of the supervisors about it. Um, who, can, I, can I ask who was the first person to whom you spoke? Jesus. I spoke to one of the supervisors about it, and I shared sorry, it. We, at the borough level, at the central level? At the level? borough level. Okay, and which supervisor? I don't want to say right okay. now. I don't want to say today. Okay. Tomorrow might be something different. But I spoke to him. Can I ask what action was taken in response? None. None. Oh, yeah, there was action. Okay. He went back and told the development staff what I reported to him. And then that is when the div- that is when the superintendent forbid the rest of the staff to speak to me. So staff was a scared staff was afraid to speak to me because they were told that if they spoke to me they would be retaliated against. They was told that I was making serious allegations and they had to stay away from me. So they was afraid to even speak to me. <clears throat> but that was towards the end. It had gotten to that point. And um, it was noted, and I'll end here, that Throgsnack went eight months without a property manager. Correct. That's but correct. Did you express concerns about the lack of property? Most ma- definitely. I was very passionate about expressing yes. concerns. Um, <clears throat> and a few times uh, the borough director had... Um, the deputy director come to the development and sit. Um, And I wasn't really in favor of that because it was during the times that he came and sat, everything would be okay. But it was when he wasn't there, it was chaos. Understood. um, um, Councilman. Uh, um, Madam President. uh, Speak it. I I appreciate your testimony. Um, Thank you for coming here. And testifying. Thank you. Okay, great. Do we have any? No more questions. No, no more questions. Uh, I wasn't supposed to say that. Wait, let me just say this one more time. I do. I'm practicing for when I get married. I do. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Johnson. I'm speaking it in existence. The, the, I do. The, the 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 next panel is uh, the final panel is Lisa Kenner. <laughs> then. You don't thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. I can raise my right hand. I can tell the truth. That you can just testify directly. Oh, just talk? Yeah. You know, we, we only had Ms. Johnson testify because she was responding to a DOI report. Oh, okay. No, and I'm, you know, I'm so glad that I did come um, as the president of Van Dyke Houses. Sorry, I, you could, though, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I thought I was sitting in my living room. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Kenner. I'm the resident association president at Van Dyke Houses. And I I came out here because I seen what was going on. And as a federal colleague of mine, she may live in the Bronx and I may live in Brooklyn, but we share the same thing. We want better for our our residents, and we have to stick together. What she's gone through, I have been through. I know what it is for people. I hope I don't get too compassionate, you know. I know what it is you're trying to fight to make the best for your residents and people coming after you. And my councilwoman is sitting at the table and she know part of my story. You know, um, I've been sick, but God has been good to me. And I'm not gonna sit down and I'm gonna keep on fighting. But um, the things that what Ms. Johnson is going through and they're trying to say, I don't have a stove in my office. And my office is in the basement. I didn't want no apartment because I know sooner or later they're going to come after it. And then also people need a place to live. You know, you're going to come after the apartment. Mine's in the basement. I don't have no stove. I don't want to cook. 
If anything, we got to cater because those days are over. You know, once your kids are grown and they out the house, that's it. When my great-grandson come in, I make them something to eat. I don't want to cook. So, I, you know, I sat here and listening to her and the things that had transpired. I mean, if you see something, you're supposed to say something. That's where you live. So if we say something, it's retaliation. I've been... The previous manager, thank God we don't have her no more, she had sent my case downtown three times to try to get me put out, a place where I grew up, born and raised and grew up. When I got my apartment, I was 19 years old, and I always said, nobody's going to make me lose my apartment. I used to tell my son the same thing. You act like a fool, you won't be living here, because I had to fight for my apartment. Um... I had worked with six managers before that. Never had the problem with them. We may not see eye to eye, but didn't go after me the retaliation as far as getting residents against each other, running against all kinds of stuff. It's nonsense, you know, and, and NYCHA need to stop that. And like I said, you can't have a partnership with anybody. You got to have a relationship first. I don't partner with everybody because everybody ain't for you. But I, I know what it is that you have to sometimes use your own money to do what you have to do in your neighborhood. Um, like I said, um, it's been good for a couple of weeks because we have a new manager. Um, I met with him. Um, we sat down and talked with him. Um, councilwoman know that we was at the mayor's action plan. And I wanted to introduce him. So I introduced him. He stood up. You know, everybody so that's the new one. But I just think that what the city council have to do, how you have to be more hands-on, because things are changing in NYCHA. Um, you see RAV and everything is going changing and things like that. But they don't know, the people that work for housing don't know. If it wasn't for the residents, they won't have no job. And if they don't have no job, what are they going to do? You know, um, so they need to come and stop being doing retaliation. I know about retaliation. I had to pray so much. I'm going to tell you, you could call my pastor. I had to call my pastor and tell my pastor, you know, I'm getting tired of this person. She just keep nitpicking, nitpicking, nitpicking. He said, Lisa, pray. I said, yeah, well, I pray, pray, pray. So he said, Lisa, don't do nothing because the church ain't got no money to get you out of jail. And see, I was going to give her the satisfaction. I have patience. And one thing I want to say to all the president, you got to have patience. You can't just jump up and just want to just start fighting and everything. I have patience. But I have been, let me tell you, I have so many emails that I have sent. I even, even went to the IGs. That's how bad it was. It seems like even I went to safety and security. I wish he was still here. It seemed like when I went to safety and security and they came and talked to me, next month I was getting a letter from 250 Broadway come down. I had to get a lawyer. My lawyer told them they didn't make no sense because I wasn't bothering nobody. You think I got time to with their drama? No. I want to make sure the building got painted. Um, we got windows, things that people could enhance the lives of the people that lived there. That's every time safety and security came, it looked like I was getting a letter to go to 250 Broadway. So I, then I had to call the lawyer. My lawyer told him, next time, we'll be going on TV because you're harassing me. They create a hostile environment. I was born and raised in Van Dyke. I'm not trying, I'm not moving. I'm, I'm sorry, I love where I live at. I'm old at this age now. I'm not trying to get no house. What I'm going to get a house for? So you got to maintain what is there. So that's what, I'm glad I came down here for Ms. Johnson. You know, I don't know the whole details, what went on at Throb Neck, but I know that when you out here and you're, we're not getting paid, you may get a stipend. I mean, when we started off with a stipend, $40, and you'd be going all over the place. They didn't went to 100 The most you can get is 200 Where people are sitting, they getting paid eighty, eighty thousand dollars ninety thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars where where the mayor had put in the, um, the thing about with the doors and stuff, the intercom, 
you don't take a rocket scientist to tell you that from rising to files, somehow intercom's not even working. So the doors are locked, how people get in, that's how they get vandalized. And nobody been saying that. I've been talking and talking, they still haven't done. And these people get money. They get paid to provide the service. So you want to get after us, who's getting after them? So hopefully now we got this monitor here, and hopefully do we have you there, um, council members? I'm going to say council members. I'm not going to put just one on one, need both. That, that things will get better, that they won't come down on people so hard, especially, you know, President, you try and make it better, and it's like they, they, I know about retaliation. God knows I know. I had to put up with it for four years until January the 25th, 2019. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. No, she's not here. Okay. So this concludes, the, this final panel concludes the hearing. Um, this hearing is adjourned.